Hey sweaties, I look really bad. <laughs> well, okay, hey, if this is the first time you're seeing me, stop. Ho, oh, stop. You don't get it, okay, you don't get it yet. I don't look like this normally. If this is the first time you're seeing my face, so sorry about that. My name is Hannah and you are now an honorary sweaty. If you're sweaty or not, it doesn't matter. We're all sweaty. <laughs> what we've been doing on this channel for the last, how long has it been? Three months? Breaking down the entire American Horror Story timeline. Gone through nine seasons so far. I'm proud of us, mostly me. I'm proud of you too because you know what, these videos, I didn't actually mean for them to be as long as they are. Anyways, so we get into seasons 10, 11, and 12 and we're gonna finish it up. We've made it to season 10, people. Double digits. Season 10 of American Horror Story double feature. And this first part of double feature, American Horror Story Red Tide. Okay. I, you know what? Maybe I should just go ahead and show you. <laughs> I went all out for this one. <laughs> I, oh my God, oh my God. I see, <laughs> you see, hey, this is serious. <laughs> this is serious, people, shut up. Get it all out now, go ahead and laugh it up. I knew I could never pull off being bald. And there's a point to this. It's gonna make sense, I hope. I'm gonna wear this until we get to it, so I'm not so distracting. I am in my robe. If there's makeup on it, no there's not. Let's shut the hell up and let's get into this. I'm gonna give you my ranking of Red Tide. Mmm. I enjoyed it. I will get into it more. I don't wanna just go ahead and explain why I didn't give it the full five. If you're not clued in, we're ranking, well, I'm ranking each season out of five. Freak Show is the highest rated season on this channel. Thank you. I was like, oh, for sure, people are gonna agree with me. Freak Show being the best season of all time. No, not at all. Not a lot of people really liked it that much. Wait, I just think it's fun to see how everybody ranks each season. We all have different opinions, apparently. We'll just go ahead and get into it. There's six episodes to Red Tide. Go ahead and start in the year of our Lord and Savior. 2021, we have got the Gardner family. Come on down, the Gardner family. Harry Gardner, and this is Finn Whitrock. He got the biggest picture, because I love Finn Whitrock. Ranking is heavily influenced by how much screen time Finn Whitrock got. Harry is a screenwriter, writes scripts for television shows. The Gardner family lives in New York, but they're coming down to Provincetown, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Get the creative juices flowing. Work on a new pilot for a new TV show that he's been offered to write and he's got a wife named Doris. Now Doris is pregnant. That's not the only personality trait about her, but now they've had trouble with pregnancies before, several miscarriages. She's an interior designer and she actually won a contest on Instagram to design a new house that they're moving into. That they're just renting it. She's gonna redo the whole, re, what do you call it? Redesign the whole interior of the house. And then they also have a daughter named Alma. I don't know if I can stress this enough. I wanted to punt this kid so far across this. I couldn't stand this little bitch. She played her role very well. Whoever this actress was, I don't remember. She's a violinist. A vi yeah, violinist. She plays the violin. Her only goal in this life is to make it to the Philharmonic Orchestra to be first chair. She is obsessed. And she's playing this one piece called Pig a guinea or pig a pig. A, it, it sounds fine to me. What do I know? I don't know anything about classical music, but apparently she's not getting it and it's driving her fing nuts. Anyway, they're on the way to the house and they see a dead deer. And Harry gets out, he goes up and looks at it, and he sees that the throat has been clawed out. Something went to town on this poor little deer. And while they're driving away, we see the deer get snatched up by something and pulled off the road. After they've gotten settled in, Harry goes out to the store. He sees people turning on porch lights, but they're red. It's winter time. And they keep reiterating that many people usually leave Provincetown during the winter. Well, while he's at the store, he runs into someone named Karen. Not your average Karen. And Karen is a junkie, high on meth. And she's also constantly sick with bronchitis, the flu and whatever. Now Provincetown also has a very serious drug problem. <laughs> And she goes up to Harry, spazzing out. You need to leave. You need to go home, motherfucker. Like she keeps calling him motherfucker, yelling at him, and he's very confused because he's like, "What did I do?" But then the store owner he ends up kicking Karen out. She's no hypodermic Sally. She is a weird O. They show a montage of him really struggling to write this screenplay. He's got serious writer's block. He hasn't been able to come up with anything in a long ass time. Agency is about to drop him because they're like, "Well, you can't produce." Shit. 
Doris can't make any decisions about any design that she wants to do. She keeps looking at two separate curtains that look exactly the same. And then almost playing that pic piccolo whatever song. <laughs> What the name of it is creating a bunch of racket and noise harry ends up getting really he's like can you just shut up can you shut the hell up you guys i did it again i just don't know how to turn on the uh the record button i'm not i ain't built for this life after harry <laughs> yells and all Morris is like girl let's just go for a walk so they go walking and they find a cemetery and what do they find at the cemetery a baldy. <laughs> they see a pale man walking around and he's kind of scoping them out and he's like getting all twitchy. I think he's tweaking. They're getting chased down by this pale man. They get chased into their house. They lock up all the doors and everything like that. And then the pale guy is just sitting there at the window like. <laughs> so then we're going to meet police chief Burleson. I'm not going to lie. Everybody's names kind of just like went in one ear and out the other. Other than the four or five main characters that we got going on, most of the mom was like, wait, what was her name again? So I'm just probably going to call her chief. Like she is so nonchalant about this situation. It's probably just a druggie. Like you guys are fine. Nobody's going to commit any crimes this time of year because most people are gone anyways. I was a cop down in like Dallas or something. She says, you know why I moved here? Because it's quiet. So she's really like, what the f you want me to do about all of this? <laughs> Harry ends up going to still trying to think of things to write about. He is so stuck. By morning, he hasn't written anything. He goes out for a run on the beach. He runs into a dismembered body. He actually finds two bloodied up, gutted, and he's like, <laughs> throws up on, on the beach. Over my salad. <laughs> they cut to the police and the medical examiner. And they're like, eh, it's probably just a shark attack. And he's like, are you kidding he goes back home he tells doris hey why don't we go out to eat like one restaurant in town the muse well doris ends up getting really sick and they think it's like morning sickness he tells harry you go out you bring me back a steak or something and i'm just gonna stay here with alma while he's at the bar he meets I, now see you get a point for this macaulay culkin mickey it is so good to see you again <laughs> i hadn't seen macaulay culkin since like richie rich mickey he is a male prostitute and he's also a meth head it's up to Harry in the bar, he starts hitting on him a little bit. You want me to, you know. <laughs> Harry's like, no, thank you. The bartender kicks Mickey out. Harry is sitting there and he's listening to people do a duet. And that would be Sarah Cunningham. What the hell's his name? Austin Somers. He looks like an elf in this picture. Islands in the stream, that is what we are. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. After they finish up, he's finishing up his meal and he gets sent a drink. I gotta sneeze, hang on. <laughs> oh gosh and he tells them <laughs> and he tells the bartender i didn't order this they ordered it for you it was over he talks to them austin he is a playwright composer three tonys and then sarah has written countless bestsellers romance novels under the pseudonym belle noir and then harry's like oh, of course i recognize you i know exactly who you are and then they say that just stay in provincetown it's where they get their creative juices flowing it inspires them to make their best work we love the winter time it's like the time that they're in now this is prime time for us karen ran in there and she was trying to get warm from the cold eating scraps off of people's leftover like dinner plates and stuff like that well she runs up to harry again and she tells him stay away from these blood suckers as in those two. They just kind of chalk it up to being like the town junkie. <laughs> and he talks about out here writing a pilot. He's got writer's block and they're like, oh, that won't last long. Harry is sitting down trying to write again, but out of nowhere, he gets attacked by one of my kind, a pale person. They wrestle, they wrestle, and then he ends up killing him, beats him to death. Chief comes by and she's like, we're gonna have to have you come down to the station and give some statements, but you're not in trouble because it was self-defense. But then Harry's like, this is no druggie. He's not a tweaker. He was trying to rip out my throat. The police leave. Both Doris and Harry are like, well, let's leave. Out of here, goodbye. So we're gonna cut to another scene. Mickey is in bed with Miss Sarah. They had some sex. She is asking Mickey for a little bit of blood ma'am he says no you almost killed me last time it was all the drugs in your system it just i got a little crazy but it won't happen again i can stop myself and he's like no no i'm not doing that well then she says you're either gonna let me suck your blood or you're not getting paid you're not getting any money he needs money for drugs so he's like fine cuts his wrist and num 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 mmm delicious karen is out there at the dumpsters looking for food uh gets a phone call on a burner phone from sarah and she says i need you to go get something for me tonight karen's like please don't make me do this again she's like you have three hours later on we see her show up to sarah's house carrying a little baby sarah 
is gonna eat it. She's gonna drink its blood. She says this is in exchange for keeping you safe from the creatures out there, you know. Austin calls Harry and he says, come on over, I got something for you. And he gives him a baggie full of black pills. He says they don't have a name yet. And if you have any sort of talent, this is going to help you create the best art of your life. You're going to create your masterpieces. But if you have no talent, you will become a pale person. You know, when I was doing this, I was like, is this kind of like a diss at myself? <laughs> Am I telling myself I have no talent? <laughs> this is so distracting. Big juicy brain. Harry's like, I'm not taking this shit. But he says, well, if writing is what you're meant to do, who cares what it costs? Then we see Harry getting a call from his agent, Ursula. You need to step on it. I haven't seen anything. She's like, where is the progress? Agency's about to drop your ass because your last things that you created were not that great. Safety nets financially, they're not there anymore. Can't pull this off. You better go apply at the Walmart. He hangs up and he's sitting there and he's looking at the little baggie of pills. He takes one. Well, watching from the other room in secret is Miss Alma. Pack up the car, they're ready to leave. And then Harry looks like he just got shot. He goes, oh, Doris is like, are you all right? He says, I need my laptop. I got to go back inside. I just got the idea. It's all happening. I can see it all in my head right now. Runs back inside. Doris and Alma are looking at him like, and he starts tearing it up, writing like you've never seen before. The keyboard is getting smashed. Alma, she's trying to practice her orchestra piece and she can't focus. He goes up to Doris and tells her, saw her dad take a pill. And so Doris is like, did you take speed what are you doing because he's acting like a total nut job anytime doris and alma try and talk to him or like get his attention he's like F off F off i'm doing something here and now they're you know in a town where drugs are running rampant are you on meth well alma keeps asking if she can take a pill because she's seeing how well it's working for her dad and doris is like no ma'am so then doris goes up and confronts harry well they start having an argument because he's like i'm not on anything i'm fine i'm fine he's like frothing at the mouth alma comes in there and she's like i saw you take something harry ends up snapping at her well at least i'm talented enough to do my own thing he insults her for not being able to play that violin piece and she's like noted and then he tells doris <clears throat> they actually need to stay at the house for a couple of days while he finishes it up. So later on in the day, they go out, get out of the house, get away from him for a couple of hours. They come back with sandwiches. Gives him a sandwich and he's like, hey, I'm sorry. I know I'm acting like a dingus right now. Gets a bite of his sandwich and he's like, oh, ugh, what is this? And she's like, it's turkey. He says, I think it's bad. It's spoiled. He sniffs it and she's like, it's fine. So he's not eating. He hasn't slept. He probably hasn't peed. I love how peeing is like my main concern. All day and all night, the next morning, he's still going at it. And she picks up a page from the printer and looks at it and reads it. She's like, this is really good. This is your best work. But she's concerned for him because he's acting like a nut. He basically all but confirmed that he did take something. She gets mad at him for that. And then he's like, I gotta leave. <laughs> I gotta go to the store. I'm hungry. He scoops up like 20 steaks. Store owner comes up to him and he's looking at his cart and he's like, I see the writer's block is gone. He knows that he took a pill. I took a pill and a bees. When he's walking home, the pale people, my kind, they surround him, but they don't attack him. So they just kind of... They just smell him. And they're like, ah, whatever, bye. And they leave. So he's like, okay. Harry gets home. This is kind of disgusting. He opens up all the packages of steak, drains them, and pours all of the blood, the juices, everything into a cup, and he drinks it. Then he puts all of the cubes of meat in a blender, strains it, and he drinks that too. It's disgusting. He goes back to writing some more and then Doris and Alma are sitting upstairs. He's like, I'm ready to leave. When can we go? Doris says, well, I think we can be a little bit supportive for this. He's finally found the creative flow that he needs. Outside of the house, Austin and Sarah are sitting in a car. They talk about the pill. They bring up the muse, the restaurant. And Austin says, that's what we should call it. We should call it the muse. But Harry is now gonna have to upgrade his diet. You can't live on bloody steaks forever. In the kitchen the next day, Doris is cutting up some vegetables. Harry and her end up having more of an argument about when they're gonna leave. Harry's not very supportive of Doris's job too. That starts trickling into the conversation. He's very indecisive when it comes to her artistic vision and it doesn't bode well for making any kind of revenue. <laughs> so, well, while she's cutting vegetables, Doris ends up cutting her finger and Harry is like, mm. So he goes and he starts sucking on her finger and she's like, get the f 
off of me, you weirdo. And Harry goes over to Austin's house. What the hell is this pill? Well, then Austin says, no one knows what the pill is. The only person that knows what it is and what it's made out of is the chemist, the one that creates the pill. We'll talk about her more in a second. He tells Harry that the town has had history with a, having a drug problem. There's a new drug that is sweeping the nation. It is sweeping the town. Again, like I said, it only works if you are creative. If you're, if you're, if you're, if you're a creative person, create your masterpiece. You're gonna create something amazing. But if you're not, you don't have any talent at all, you turn into a pale person. It depletes the minerals in the bloodstream that need to be replenished quickly. So he needs to get fresh blood. It ain't gonna work with steak. And then he says that if you stop using the pill, you'll go back to normal. Have zero talent left, pretty much. Like, you're gonna go back to square one. Harry goes back home and he's like, I'm not taking these pills anymore. He apologizes to Doris, says, you know what, we can leave. This part kind of pissed me off because Doris now is like, you know, I still have a job here to do. I still have to redecorate this whole place. What about my needs? Like, the whole time she's been asking, like, when are we leaving? And now that the time is present, she's like, I still have a job. Ursula calls, lets Harry know that his pilot show has been greenlit and that Joaquin Phoenix, the Joker himself, would like to star in the show. No questions asked. Also, Netflix wants to have a deal with him to create another show. So then him and Doris, they're like, oh my god, no, wait, we can stay. When he goes back to type more, he can't. He's got writer's block because he needs another pill. So then he goes to see Austin and Sarah for more pills. They're going out to eat. Let's go out and get a bite. So on the way over, he's asking about how many people use the pill. And they say a few. Austin and Sarah only use it season seasonally. Can I? Am I okay? And during the winter times to crank out a couple of books and plays. And then they, they stop. They need to have fresh blood weekly. <laughs> that sounds like a newsletter. Fresh blood weekly. So then they say that they choose victims that will not be missed. So where they're going now is they found somebody on Craigslist that posted a bunch of random items like a bike and a stereo and a camera. This dude just stole some sh** and now is trying to make money selling it online so that he can probably most likely go get some drugs. Her also tells him that there are two rules. Don't feed in town so that the police, Miss Chief, won't suspect anything. And number two, always wear your gloves. But when they feed off the man, they see that the guy's a junkie. Harry's like, why do I feel weird? He says, well, he's a drug addict, so you're getting a secondhand high from the drugs. Too messy with his kills, so... They tell him to go see Dr. Feldman to go get his teeth filed down into sharp fangs. She'll give him some, like, a grill, basically, to put over. Karen and Mickey, they're hanging out. Mickey's little shack thing that he's staying in. And then he goes into talking about how he loves movies. He loves to write screenplays, but he's never finished anything. He stole some pills from Sarah. I think I've got talent. I think I could do this. And I know you're talented too. She's an artiste. She's a painter. Mickey says that he went and some of her paintings being sold at a thrift shop. You've got some serious talent. Do you want to take one of these pills with me? And she's like, no. <laughs> but he goes ahead and he takes a pill anyway. Harry is going to see Dr. Feldman, also known as Lark. That's Lark. She owns a tattoo shop and also clothing. I don't know, she kind of sells a little bit of everything that has been taking the Muse pill. Her talent was tattoos. She also went to dental school. She is in charge giving everybody the proper teeth. She ends up filing down his teeth to sharp pointy fangs and then gives him fake teeth to put over top of the fangs. Miss Alma, she finds a pill, she pops a pill. And instantly has perfected her violin piece. This is all kind of happening in rapid succession. So Harry and Mickey are both riding away, tearing it up. However, Doris, she's still struggling. She just can't tell the difference between white and white. Well then after Alma finishes her piece, Doris now, she's getting irritated by it. So Doris goes in there and she's like, can you shut up? Please. And Alma says that her mother will never understand greatness. It takes someone great to understand great. And that's not you, bestie. You need to go upstairs and pack your bags because we're leaving tonight. We're not staying here anymore. I was like, no, I feel fine here. Me and dad, we're living our best lives out here. It's you who's the problem. So you need to figure it out. So then Doris gets mad, sends her to her room. Harry is out and about. Find someone under a pier. It's called, <laughs> it's called Dick Doc because that is where all, that's where all the homosexuals go. <laughs> the male prostitutes tend to hang out at. You want me to suck your dick? And Harry's like, no, but I do want to drink your blood. He ends up killing him, slashing his throat, drinking up the blood. Comes back home. And Doris wakes up and Alma is gone. She sees Harry and she's like, where the hell did she go? He says, oh, she went out for a walk. She's like, um, with these pale people running around? This drug ridden town? She sees Miss Alma in the cemetery. She goes, <coughs> she goes up and she finds her sitting in front of a tombstone. 
drinking blood from a rabbit. And Doris is like, mayday, mayday, what the hell? Doris is scrubbing her down, trying to scrub any kind of diseases off. Saw our daughter in the cemetery drinking blood from a rabbit. And Harry is like, <laughs> he knows. Chief shows up and she's questioning both of them because there are reports that Alma was out in the cemetery bloodied because they found the rabbit that she was chewing on. They want to bring Alma into the station because the bite marks match the man that was found underneath the pier, the one that Harry killed. They start arguing and one thing leads to another and Doris ends up falling down the stairs. They rush her to the hospital. The baby's fine. They want her to stay in the hospital for a couple of days. So Harry is like, as soon as the couple of days is up, we're out of here. On the way back home, Harry's talking to Alma like, what the fuck? She says she wants to be the greatest violinist of all time. But she says she didn't mind killing the rabbit. Killing things is, you know, it's whatever. And she says, well, I'll stop if you stop. An ultimatum. It doesn't last long because Harry down. He tries to write, can't do it. So then he goes and he digs in the trash, pulls out a baggie, pops a pill. And almost standing right there behind him like... Then they go out to eat for dinner. They both order two very extremely rare steaks. And then they start talking about the logistics. Like, what's going to happen? Still growing. You're only like... 10. We don't know how this is going to affect your body growing up. It says that you can't take it seasonally. You have to keep playing. I will get you the blood. Please don't kill anything else. Now, this is another thing that he keeps reiterating throughout the later half of the season. Well, we don't need mom. You know, mom's not like us. She's okay with being just okay. We should cut that thing off. Leave her in the dust. Harry's like, no, no, that's your mother, you idiot. He says he's going to be the one to go out and get her the blood. Says, okay, well, I'm hungry now. He takes Alma back home. He's online and he finds some people on Craigslist. So he's selling stuff. When he gets invited into the house, the couple ends up hitting him over the head and knocking him out, taking him into a cage down in the basement. He wakes up and the couple tells him, we're going to be making a porn snuff film. You're going to star in it. Don't worry, we're going to kill you afterwards. <laughs> the lady's like, I'm going to have you do me while my husband ram something up your rear end and he's like sorry <laughs> she gives him a little pill of viagra okay i'll do it so they let him out of the cage he's still handcuffed and they prop him over whatever i don't even know they're having problems with the camera when they're not looking he spits out the little viagra pill turns around rips out their throats they didn't know who they were messing with he starts to drink their blood and then he finds a thermos in their house and he drains all their blood into the thermos and brings it home for alma ursula says that you know everything is going good tarantino just got off the phone with us he wants you to write a new story for him to direct to direct to direct direct now that's what this is where i have a problem because mr tarantino no he doesn't do that that's the, that's his whole thing he only directs what he writes he only writes but whatever we're in ahs world to write a new show for hulu or he's getting deals out the wazoo then harry ends up figuring out that tarantino himself has gotten on the muse that's how he's able to knock it out of the park every time or, oh well i didn't mention ursula has shown up at the house i don't think i doesn't matter. Ursula's there. I needed to see where you were at this whole time. What kind of inspiration you're getting from this place? Because maybe I can use some. Like, I'm I'm hungry. Where do I go to eat? Well, the only restaurant in town is the Muse. Goes there. She meets Mickey. He starts hitting on her. And she's like, can you f off? I'm like, no, thank you. I've donated already. Also, Sarah and Austin are up there again, singing their hearts away. She's not having it. She's like, can they just stop? Then they go over and they kind of subtly threaten her a little bit. Why don't you meet us outside? Mickey offers to buy her a drink. Everybody's kind of crowding around her and she's clearly like, get away from me. So she ends up leaving. She's having a walk out on the beach. Mickey goes up to her and says, hey, I know you're an agent out in Hollywood. You probably hear this all the time, but if you could just take a look at my screenplay. She's like, are you on drugs or something? He's like, yeah, well, yes, but that's beside the point. Thinks that he's just on some high right now saying, yeah, fine, I'll read it. And if I don't like it, I'm just gonna burn it. She goes home, she reads it. She's like, and finds him and she says, you didn't write this. I, you. He tells her about the pill. She says she wants to be the agent that represents all of the Muse users. She asked Mickey to go ahead and steal some of the pills from Sarah. He ends up going over to Sarah's house while she's out and about with Austin and Harry. Now, Austin and Harry and Sarah feeding on three junkies at some house. And they look over and they see Harry is filling up thermoses. And Austin is like, wow, I've never thought about doing that before. But they're a little, a little suspicious. On the way back, they stop the car. They point a gun at him. All right. Who's the blood for? And he fesses up and he says, it's for Alma. They're freaking out and they say, you need to get her off of this pill or Sarah is going to eat her. Well, when they drop him off, Sarah is like, we need to 
kill him. <laughs> we need to kill both of them. Mickey's down at the beach. He attacks somebody. He gets something to eat and it's messy. He doesn't do a good job. Well, he goes back home and Sarah is waiting there for him because now she knows that he's on the pill. She'll keep giving him pills. He can bring her a thermos of blood. So now they've taken a page out of Harry's book. Whenever you go out for a kill, you bring me some too. But then she also needs the next kill. Miss Ursula. She's like, get that hoe out of here. She insulted Sarah and her singing. So there's a character. I didn't print off his picture named Holden Vaughn. And he's out on the beach talking to the chief. They found the body that Mickey has dismembered and tow up. Holden says it's a hate crime against gays. Holden is an interior designer too. In Provincetown, mourning the death of one of his uh, greyhound dogs or something like that. Mickey goes to see Ursula in the tub, sudsing it up. And he's going in there to kill her. She says the studio's offered you to rewrite series of Speed Racer. And he starts saying like, oh my god, Speed Racer. That was my favorite thing ever as a kid. Says that she will set him up for success if he takes her to meet the chemist. She's like, I can push out these pills. I can make it public and we can get her business booming. So the next day they go and they see the chemist. Ursula tells her, I can help you distribute this shit if you want. Basically what I just said. Well, after their meeting, the chemist is talking to Sarah and Austin and she's like, we need to kill her and Mickey and the gardeners. Now it's getting out of hand, people. Now Ursula is babysitting Alma. Harry leaves and he goes, I don't know if he's going for a kill. Harry's out of the house. Ursula says, hey, Alma, I'm really tired. I'm going to go upstairs and take a nap. Then the chief comes over to the house. The chief is like, look, girl, I know you and your dad are involved somehow with these murders all over town. Like, are you guys in a cult or something? Or is this some kind of blood disorder? But then Alma, she ends up stabbing the chief in the neck. Enough of you. She actually ends up draining the blood into a bowl. Harry comes home. The chief is sprawled out and looks over and sees Ursula and Alma playing cards. Ursula's like, we need to talk. We're gonna get a new year up here. Woo! 2016. The chemist, maybe I should have moved the chemist over here, is talking to Holden, trying to sell her a house, talking about the designs and interior stuff. And she's like, I don't care. I just need a place to be away from everybody. Just left my job. Want quiet and my own space. She starts making the pills right away. While she's out, she talks to Mickey about any dreams or ambitions that he might have. I would like to be a writer. Then she goes to talk about what she's been creating. So for the past nine years, she's been working with U.S. military to suppress creativity with bi biochemical engineering. But she created a drug that supercharged the occipital lobe, but it only worked on creative test subjects. So they had a big test on apes and she said some of them went f***ing nuts. She offers him to become a test subject and he says no. But she says she'll give him 50 bucks for anybody that he can wrangle up to come and be a part of this test. He's a druggie so 50 bucks that's like that's dinner. <laughs> that's dinner. Mickey hears this guy singing over at the bar. You have a decent voice why don't you go do one of these tests. He brings the guy over to the chemist. In 2016 we also see Sarah is at a bookshop is trying to sell the <laughs> uh, romance novel inspired by George Washington and Martha Washington. Martha's cherry tree. <laughs> it's very erotic and and she would thrive on Wattpad. Writing fan fiction? Are you kidding me? She would tear it up. So at her show, at her book signing, not very many people showed up. Well, the chemist is there and the chemist is the only one that buys a book from her. Sarah goes out and meets with her husband, Ray. And she's like, why didn't you come inside to sit and listen? And he says, this whole thing, it grosses me out. Your writing is so weird. <laughs> They're having a very serious strain in their relationship. He's just retired and he's spending all his time with Miss Sarah. He's like, I can't f stand you. He says this book tour that you're going on just so costly and no profit. He's like I want to go on one of these cemetery tours. She's like that's too scary for me. I can't do that. So he's like I'm going you can stay here. So she goes to the muse and she meets Mickey. He starts complimenting her on her writing. Then she just says you got meth. You look like somebody that would have some meth on you. He takes some drugs. He starts dancing around. In walks the guy that was singing at the bar and be the test subject. Do you remember him? He looks like me. He looks rough. His hair is starting to fall out. He's looking sick. He's looking pale. He says, I think I got something from Karen. I think I'm having the flu or something. He runs into the bathroom, pukes everywhere. We realize he is the first. <laughs> He's the first 
of us, the first pale person. Though. Mickey takes Sarah to the chemist. You've got some talent. She reads a couple of chapters from her book just to see if she does have talent. Well, here's what's gonna happen. I'll give you a pill, but you have to agree to let me watch you all the time and tell me everything that's going on. I just need to study you. And then she goes ahead and she takes the pill. Well, Sarah goes back to her hotel room, sees that her husband is out because then she starts writing her next novel. She finishes the whole novel in one night. Her husband comes home, he reads some of it. He says, this, you didn't write this, this is good. And she says, where have you been? He says, I've been out screwing. He says, I met somebody on that cemetery tour and we went back to her place, we got drunk and we had sex all night long. And I'm going to take a shower, I'm getting my clothes and I'm going right back over there. So suck on that. And she ends up going up to him, cutting his throat and drinking his blood. Sarah goes back to see the chemist after this little incident. Uh, well, the apes that we tested, they also were pretty spastic. They had a blood thirst would kill anybody or anything in order to get the blood. But then Sarah says, well, you know, I didn't mind it. <laughs> I didn't even care that I killed my husband. I just wanted to get back to writing my book. Holden is out and he discovers Sarah's husband, Ray, his dismembered body out on the beach. That tide is getting redder and redder. The pale guy, he's only on day three of being on this pill and he looks so bad. Back to the chemist, he says, can I please just have more of this pill? She says, no, I'm controlling the dosage right now. You don't get one until next week. But he's cold all the time. He talks about how he's vegan, but now he's craving meat. He goes and he sees Lark, Dr. Feldman. He ends up buying a coat from her, a gray. I wanted to find one because this coat is actually kind of cozy. I actually really do like it. It has like 80s shoulder pads. It's a dark gray trench coat. And he assumes the role fully of being a pale person. It's Halloween night, so he doesn't look so odd. People are like, damn, dude. Damn, Kyle. Whoa. He finds someone, ends up killing them, drinking their blood. And then he goes back to the chemist. He's confused that he drank someone's blood. The chemist tells him that what he craves now is hate and rage. He hates the world. Well, he starts getting ticked off. He charges at her. She pulls out a gun. He ends up leaving, but he goes into the alleyway and finds someone he ends up killing them, drinking their blood. All right, we're gonna go to 2018. Sarah has been on the pill for two years now. She has cranked out like six best-selling books. She's back in Provincetown for the winter. She ends up going into Dr. Feldman's shop, shopping for a new look. Um, and then we also find out that that's when Dr. Feldman started using the pill six months before Sarah goes in to meet her and that she opened up her tattoo shop and blah, blah, blah. That's also where Lark gives her a new set of teeth. Sarah is out at a drag bar. There's a bunch of drag queens sitting around in a circle. Eureka is one of them. I don't remember what her name in the show is. Also who's sitting there is Austin. He is going by the drag name Patty O Furniture. I really like the name, but he's told by the other drag queens, he's like, that name sucks ass. They don't really connect much with Patty. Just take the piss out of her. It's her time to go sing. She goes to sing. I think she's singing, take a little piece of my heart now, baby. I hope my neighbors are not out there. <laughs> Well, then the night dies down. Everybody's pretty much left the bar. Sarah goes up to Austin and says, you do not belong here. You've got talent and this is not the place where you need to be. Well, I do write plays and I actually had written a play, but the director just like, he just went missing. It was one of Sarah's kills. Sarah's been out chomping on people. And she gives them a pill, he takes it. They go to the house, home to most of the drag queen, all watching a television show. They both come in and they're like, what? What do you want? Start killing everybody. Well, Eureka makes it out and she's running around through the cemetery. And while she's out there, Papa, Papa Baldy, he goes up to her and he starts <laughs> at the top of this episode. Doris is giving birth to a baby boy. He's watching it and he's looking at all of the soiled linen covered in blood and he's like, he gets all the soiled linen before they can take it. He goes into the bathroom and he, this was disgusting. He's wringing out all of the linen plastic cups in the bathroom and drinking it. Sorry, that is coochie blood. Okay, so then they all go back home and Doris is having some really weird dreams. She wakes up and she's like, we just need to get out of here. That's what you said when I got out of the hospital. And he says, well, you know, you could have complications. You need to stay for another couple of weeks. She's like, I cannot. Mickey, he's out driving a new sports car. Not a race car that mimics the speed racer car. And he picks up Karen off the side of the road. Karen's on her way to go out to the beach, go paint. Says that the studio gave him the car. He offers her a job as a production designer. He's really trying to get her to take this damn pill. Offers to move her to LA, but she just is like, no, dude, I don't want to do this. 
fucking thing. And she just tells him, pull over. I'm going to walk back over at the gardener's house. Doris wakes up. She looks over and sees Alma is chewing on the baby's leg. She's like, what are you doing? Passes out. Harry, he caught Alma doing that. But then Alma says, well, newborn baby blood is, that is the best kind of blood you could ever get. That is the purest, cleanest kind of blood. Also, when she drank her baby brother's blood, she was able to play one of the hardest pieces has been created. She was like, I perfected it like an instant. It took no <laughs> brain power from me. He threatens to smash her violin, also to cut her off of the pill. Uh, well, Ursula is sitting next to Doris. She tells her that, you know, she just dreamed that. She was like, yeah, you were saying some weird stuff about Alma biting the baby's leg and she's gaslighting her. I've got to pay. Ursula just tells her, you need to just sit back, ride the coattails of his success, and be a good wife, and shut the hell up. Later on, when she's alone, she goes and she looks at the baby, and she sees the little mark on his leg. And then Alma comes into the room and says, hey, it's time for you to take your pills. And one of them is the muse. Doris is like, what is that? I don't know what that pill is. Says, I don't know. I just got it from dad. Take them now. Well, she's already told her to her face. She's like, you're not good at anything. Not creative at all. She knows what will happen if she takes the pill. She shows the bite mark on the baby to Harry. And Harry's like, did that at the hospital. They cut his leg or something like that. You can just tell. She's like, you guys are f***ing with me. But then Alma, she just says, you know what, guys? The gig is up. We need to just stop lying to her. Harry, he's like, no, don't do it. Alma's like, why, dad? Don't you think she's good enough? Because no, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. Doris freaks out. She just grabs the baby. When she goes outside, she sees all of the pale people. Harry grabs her and brings her back inside. So Karen, she's out on the beach painting, okay? And she's painting this cottage. Sarah comes up to her. I need you to go get me a baby. Your painting suck, by the way. <laughs> In particular, the gardener's baby. Pale people start to surround them on the beach. Karen's getting freaked out by them. Sarah says, well, you know our deal. You bring me a baby. I'll keep you protected. But if she refuses, she will gouge out her eyeballs so that she can never paint again. Doris is in her room, freak the fuck out. So she starts looking for a pair of shears, using them as a weapon. She goes downstairs. She hears Harry talking to Holden. And Holden is bashing her interior design plans. He's like, this is sh**. <laughs> Who designs this? And Doris comes down there and Harry introduces her to him. He says, well, I brought him over here to help out, you know, when you start feeling better because you're not good enough. She is speechless and she just turns and goes back upstairs. Alma comes in there and she's sitting with her while she's feeding the baby. Dora says, I think we're gonna name the baby Eli. Finally have given it a name. Really trying to coerce her into taking this pill. You're great, you are good. Alma explains that the newborn baby blood, because she's like, the gig is up, girl. Yeah, I did drink from him. Helped her play the hardest piece she's ever had to do. But Dora says, don't you ever do that again. But then Alma, she keeps on going. She gets her mom, Doris, to take the pill. Now, Karen, she goes to see Mickey. She's upset because he told Sarah where to find her. Because that beach in that spot in particular, that was like her sanctuary. He says the solution to all of these problems you're having is to take this pill. She says no once again and that she's gonna go take that baby away from them and she's gonna raise the baby. She asks him to help to so it'll save what's left of his soul. Oh that's cute. Doris sitting in bed she's frantically scratching scratching sketching design floor plans and everything like this. It's not coming out the way she wants it to and then she gets so worked up she pukes everywhere. Then Alma she tells Harry and Ursula that they should go out to eat somewhere. They leave Doris at home alone. Mickey and Karen they end up breaking in through a window and the pale people are pretty close by and then Doris sees both of them in the house. They can tell pretty rapidly turning in to a pale person. Karen, she gets freaked out, runs out into the middle of the street. Forget this, I'm not getting that baby. And she ends up on someone's like doorstep and the pale people are, we're charging. Mickey says, look, you just take this pill and you'll be fine, they'll leave you alone. It's like, no, I can't. We know how Sarah Paulson is. She says she doesn't care if she's talented or not. She just does not want to become someone that kills. Then Mickey gives her a pill, you do what you want with it. He dips, so the protection that she had from the pale people is gone. She ends up popping the pill and as soon as she does, the pale people leave her alone. But now she's taking that pill. Like after all that, Doris is at home. She shaves off whatever hair she had left. She goes over to see the baby and she's gonna go stab it. Well, Harry catches her. They wrestle each other for a little bit. He ends up getting her locked into the bathroom because this is the first time Harry's realized that she's taking the pill. And Alma says, she said that Ursula was the one that coached her in how to take the pill and how to gaslight her. By the morning time, Doris, she's calmed down now and she's just kind of sitting in there like, well, what now? So, what now? So? 
No, I'm saying what now? Is- he tells her, this is probably for the best. It's better for you so you don't have to see my star rise. That would have been too much for you. They gaslight the hell out of each other. So he opens the door and she just kind of walks out all calmly. And she joins the pale people. Karen, she gets kind of fidgety and a little twitchy after she takes the pill, but Mickey's telling her, well, it's just because you're hungry. Start making our plans. We can leave here, go out to LA. She tells him, like, I think that we're both cursed. We're, d- we're done for. He asks her, what is your masterpiece? And she points to the cottage because they're out on the beach. He says, okay, well, feed and then try and create art and see if it's work. And then she says, okay, and she attacks Mickey. She kills Mickey. He's died. She starts painting. I don't remember if we see the painting or not. She goes down to the tide, slits her wrist, and walks into the tide. The red tide. Yes, she's done. And Alma and Ursula, we see them walking down the street past the cemetery. They see Doris out there looking for things to eat. They say they're going to meet with the chemist and that Ursula wants to go represent the chemist and be her agent. Like she's trying it again. We're on the last episode of this part of the season. And I'm going to be honest with you, it ends very abruptly. I don't know, it feels very sped up. People out on the water, and before the fishermen take off, they see a body floating around in the water. That would be the chief's body. There's a city council meeting, and Holden is on the city council. State police show up, and we gotten word that your chief has been murdered, and we're investigating because there seems to be quite a few murders that are similar to hers, and the city council's basically just like, yeah. Well, you don't need to do that. The council says, well, there's no real evidence that this is actually a murderer. It could just be an animal. The state police officer, she's like, are you f***ing kidding? Like, what is wrong with you people? The council is basically telling the state police to shut the hell up. Because they're like, if word gets out about this, people are not going to want to come here. And then the officer tells them, well, I'm going to find out what's going on here. Because I think you're all f- lying. As she's walking away, Holden's like, don't worry, I'll take care of it. Holden, Austin, Sarah, and the chemist are all meeting up. And the chemist reminds them that she asked these Hollywood people to be killed and that the Muse users will be crushed by the bureaucracy bureaucracy if they don't make the problems go away. Bureaucracy. Whatever. F*** off. <laughs> okay, so Harry, he's taken the pill one last time. He's written five years worth of material. He gives it to Ursula and he says, that's it. We're done. I've got enough material for us to live off of. Like, this is gonna bring in a lot of dough. We're gonna be fine. Alma, she's upset. She calls him selfish. I'll be around now. I don't have to write anymore. I get to spend all my time with you. And she's like, Ursula's trying to tell him, look, bud, this is what success looks like. Buck up. Get with the program. Alma's like, okay, you're right, dad. So she goes and gives him a hug, but she's looking at Ursula and she's like, and then they see that the door, the front door has been broken into. Go upstairs and they find Eli is gone with a note in his crib from Sarah saying, I'm going to kill your baby if you don't get here um, because we need to talk. Ursula tells him, I'm not going, but I do have a plan to help you. So Ursula goes out to the cemetery to get some backup. She rallies up the pale people, offers them a vial of new drugs. It could possibly reverse all this damage that's happened to your body. And then she tells them if they take it to go attack the artist. Sarah's house, she has Eli (laughs) laid out in like a cornucopia, (laughs) lettuce leaves and stuff and dressing him up for a a meal. And Harry comes in and says they'll leave and never come back if she gives him the baby. Austin and Sarah end up cornering both of them. The pale people burst through. They start raising hell, raising canes and ripping out Austin's throat and Sarah's throat. And then they're going to go after the gardeners too. But Ursula, she's got a gun and she turns to them. Bop, 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 and she kills him. The chemist goes and snatches up Eli. Harry turns to Alma, and now we're gonna leave and we can be together. Well, then Alma is like, no, we're not. And she ends up ripping his throat out and killing her dad. Oh, God, no. Oh, God. Finn went wrong. So the chemist and Ursula had devised a plan. You remember when Alma and Ursula were walking over to see the chemist get rid of everybody here. So she gave her newer pills that would reverse the behavior of the pale people so that they would go spastic and kill everybody. Ursula says that she's going to spin the story around and make it so that Harry lost his mind and killed everybody. They all go out to LA. Three months later, the police police officer who took a pill and became a pale person, he's out walking Hollywood Boulevard, starts to lose it, and he starts attacking random civilians. The chemist and Alma are sitting on the couch watching this coverage. Basically, the pill has kind of got its tentacles all over the place. Ursula shows up. She's been out at like Starbucks trying to push this pill. Wannabe writers. Everybody in LA thinks that they're something and most of them are not. A real serious uptick in the pale people running around. Alma, she's been prepping for this audition for the Philharmonic orchestra. She nails it, but it's between her and this one other boy and they're sitting in the room waiting and she just outright says, I'm better than you. (laughs) And he's like, 
Okay. He basically says like, just a smoke show. This is gonna fizzle out. You'll make headlines, you'll make the news, the youngest girl ever, blah, blah, blah. You can't work in a group. You have to be able to work with everybody and you're on your own playing field. She can't do it with a orchestra. Well, then the judges come back in there and they're like, where is he? And she says, he went outside to smoke. They see him in the back alleyway with this throat slashed. Miss Alma has killed him. A man giving a lecture at some college. He's getting frustrated with one of the students that's questioning him about story building. And I created this formula for complicated, in-depth, detailed storytelling. But the professor's just like, you don't get it. Ends up introducing Ursula and she says, I've given you all a little pill. If you're willing to take it, you could be the greatest. So some of them take it, some of them don't. And then we cut to the outside world, hell on earth out there. We see the chemist has snatched up Eli, put him in the back of a car. Everybody's running around attacking everyone. And she puts him in the car and she's like, we're getting out of here. And then they dip. That's it. That's how it ends. <laughs> like, she just left Alma behind. She left her. Like, so you're thinking, like, this has got to be solved in the last bit of the season, right? No. No. We're left with more questions than answers. It had potential. That's what's so frustrating about this. But they just cut it off. I don't know. This season was during COVID. I think that they were supposed to start filming in, like, April of 2020. And that didn't happen. I think Kathy Bates was supposed to be in this at some point. When they actually were able to come back, she wasn't able to do it. So they had to rewrite parts and stuff. I don't know. It just felt like a total mess. A lot of people didn't like the last episode of this because it was so rushed. It was just kind of like, well, we'll just kill everybody off. So now we're we're gonna go ahead and get into the second half of this double feature, Death Valley. I'm gonna take this down because point five. This was the worst thing I've ever seen American Horror Story do. It is awful. Kept waiting for them to tie it all together. It doesn't happen. Right, we're gonna start off in 1954. It got a point five is because this was when I, it had some potential to me. Like I believed in it for just a second. The black and white parts are the most promising, but they're still boring as hell. So in 1954, we've got a housewife at home. Her name is Maria, they're in Albuquerque. She's called in her son, little Timmy, in the driveway riding on his bike. Come on, it's time to eat dinner. Then she starts seeing the lights are flickering and record player spinning backwards and playing the record backwards to the window to look out. Little Timmy's gone. Little dust devils are spun up around his bike, but he's gone. She picks up the phone. She hears the sound of her son's voice saying, don't be afraid. And then she ends up floating up to the ceiling. She sees boy walk in. It looks like Timmy. He's a little off. My notes, I put an altered boy, not an altar boy, like Catholic, comes in and he offers his hand to her. The next thing we see is her husband walk in. And the place is toe up, toe up from the flow up. He looks at his wife and her eyes are glowing white. Maria, <laughs> she just waves her hand like this and his head explodes. Also, while that's happening, I'm gonna be bald again because I'm gonna play the role <laughs> of former US President Dwight D. Eisenhower. <laughs> I look more, I know who I look like. I look like the Six Flags old man. When he's not known for like wearing glasses, but there's a couple of scenes where he does wear glasses. <laughs> oh God. Dwight D. Eisenhower. I can't do this. Putting his back on. Show's over. His team come up to him and they tell him about an airspace incursion near Edwards Air Force Base. He goes back home and he's talking to his wife, Mamie, Mamie, Mammy. I don't know. I didn't read about her in school. <laughs> well, I, I just gotta go to a dentist appointment and I'll, I'll be back. She knows that he's lying, but she's like, whatever, go for it. They go out to this site. It's a UFO. They find a body. Eisenhower, he thinks it's a little baby or, you know, a child's body because it's about that size. And then they also find a woman crouched over by some trees. They see that she is covered in like scars all over her back, but they're like geometric shapes. Eisenhower is like, what is your name? My name is Amelia Earhart. She, yeah, the coconut crab one, yes. Death Valley is chock full of American conspiracy theories. UFOs abducting people. Amelia Earhart. I'm surprised they didn't bring Helen Keller into the situation. <laughs> people think that she's not real. Brought back to a base, like a little hospital area, talking about her flight went missing. She says, all of my tools on the flight went kaput. And that she saw this bright light. That's all I remember until I woke up. He asked, well, what about all these scars on your back? She says they were scars from the experiments. He 
also says that he's the current president. She starts freaking the hell out because she's like, no, you're not. I don't know who even was president when she was. Franklin D. Roosevelt was president when <laughs> she was alive. You're not my president. <laughs> starts freaking out. They come in there and they give her a shot and they sedate her. All the people around her are like, she's just f***ing around. She's just insane. But Dwight... We're on a first name basis. Mamie's had a picture of her on her nightstand for the last three years. She looks exactly like that picture. That's her. And they say, well, her flight went out in 1937. Ah, doesn't look like she's aged a day. And sir, you should know she's two months pregnant. Like go and look at this little body. It's some kind of alien carcass. They see it's a hollow shell and inside is some sort of mass, like little tentacle things. And it jumps out and latches onto their faces and kills them. So they're all watching from the outside like, but then they see Maria, the housewife, Eisenhower, tries to negotiate with her and we can do things like this. We could talk about this. And she says, shut, shut your mouth. Y'all can listen to me. I can tell you what we're going to do. So that's going to cut off right there. Don't bother with this, but I'm keeping the year up here. And this is where we meet some insufferable cast members. I hated every second of watching these people on screen. I couldn't take it. I kept thinking this was like, you know, sometimes when you watch a show, a show within a show, they kind of overdo it a, a lot. That's what I thought was happening. So I kept giving them the benefit of the doubt. This, this group of people, Cal, his only personality trait is that he went to Japan one time. Kendall, my name is Candle. She's a doctor or is in medical school. Also, she has joined a group of people. Luddites? I don't know, but they don't like technology. Technology is just, it's progressed too much for our minds. Troy? Um, gay? That's it. We have Jamie. Only characteristic that we know is that dating someone, and it was going good up until they had sex because ejaculated on her allergic reaction, and apparently she's allergic to sperm. Troy and Cal tell that they are both in a relationship. The night goes on, they start drinking and talking. Watching these four people try to act, I don't know if this was their first time. Maybe don't. I kept thinking they were gonna be like, all right, cut, and then it was gonna pan out and we were gonna see the set. This was how they actually were acting. <laughs> If I was on the shoot, I'd be like, so you're gonna do that for the whole shoot? <laughs> By the end of the night, everybody's kind of on their phone. What's her face? Candle. Come on guys, why are we all on our phones? We need to get back to the good old days. And then she talks about how the lecture she went to that sparked this idea, the guy that was giving the lecture, he was just a hot dude and she just wanted to bang him. Girl, you just want the dick, it's okay. Call, kind of call her out because she's wanting to be a doctor and they're like, bitch, how can you be a doctor if you don't even want to use technology? You don't even want to use your phone. They're planning a trip to go camping in Death Valley. She says, look, for this trip, can we all leave our phones at home? Like the good old days. Good old days? They're only in their 20s, so that was like in 2000. What do you mean? She's acting like they're from the 70s. <laughs> they all agree. They're crazy. But then they go on their camping trip. It's boring. Who cares? They're walking around trying to find this pond and they don't find it. But what they do find is a whole, the whole area is covered with dead cattle. Candle goes <laughs> to one of them and they're all, they've all been bisected. So they're cut from the snout all the way down. Clean cut, no mess. There's no guts or anything. Well, the eye blinks at her and starts to moo at her. They all take off running. They get in the car. They all see this white light. What's her face? The one that suggested not to, not to bring a phone. She says, oh my God, call 911. Call 911. Car dies. The crickets go quiet. A white light that kind of shines down on them in a cone. See a figure walking towards them. See some like tentacle things come through the windows and that's always a wake up but they're all in different seats. I'm gonna take off, but then they're like, well, what the f is Jamie? This one, right? And is walking towards them and then passes out. So then Cal goes, picks her up, take off, leaving. They're back home. Candle is talking to her night boyfriend and she's telling him what happened. And he says, I think that the boys probably just drugged you guys. She starts getting sick. She calls Jamie. Jamie's getting sick. The boys are getting sick morning sickness and whatnot, having weird cravings. Jamie's like, this is how it felt when I had that pregnancy scare. All go over to Candle's house and they take pregnancy tests. Everybody, the boys included, are pregnant. I'm gonna tell you, I watched this season as it was airing. This episode, by the end of it, when we find out that they're pregnant, I said, that's all, I'm done. <laughs> I tapped out at this episode, the first go around. 1963, so at this point, Eisenhower is not president anymore. John F. Kennedy, Eisenhower, and his vice president, Richard Nixon. I don't know much about Richard Nixon other than the obvious. I don't know if this is how he actually talked, but the actor playing him, I wanted to punch him in the 
fucking face because the way he talks is so annoying. Richard is telling Eisenhower, we need to talk to the current president and tell him about the treaty we have with the aliens. Nixon is afraid that Kennedy's brother, Robert, is gonna spill the beans on everything. Whatever, he thinks that his brother is gonna f it all up. Later on, we see Eisenhower, Nixon, and John F. Kennedy sitting in the Oval Office. They tell him about the alien treaty. And John F. Kennedy, he's upset because the technology exchange that they have going on with the aliens at the expense of all of these American lives. Later on, we see JFK cozying up to one starlet, one of my biggest gloves in this life, Marilyn Monroe. It's another conspiracy. It was that they had a relationship. You know, she did the happy birthday telling her about the alien treaty. And she says something like, I believe in aliens because I think I was abducted as a child. He should go public with this. He forms a group of people in the White House about how they're gonna go about making it public. Not long after that at all. Well, we all know what happens. He is shot dead. Mamie and White, they're sitting at home watching the news coverage. Mamie's kind of like not phased at all. She tries to tell him what the treaty was worth it, even if it means that we're gonna lose a couple of lives. So now we're gonna cut back to 1954 when he's actually going to sign the treaty. He's feeling indecisive where Maria, they also call it subject one, the alien that's inside of her. She's telling him to sign this treaty. Then the team of people that Eisenhower's surrounded by, they're telling him, well, if we don't sign it, the aliens could go to Russia. And then us all over. But she explains that the aliens world is dying. They need to find a solution and the experiments are needed to create hybrids. The carcass that they cut open, like Maria's body, they're trying to make hybrid alien humans to populate the planet. Are you following? Someone stands up and he's like, oh, f this. It's a gun to her. She makes his head explode. Everybody around her is like, uh, for real? <laughs> Alien subject inside of Maria's body says, well, the test subject, well, she is not useful anymore. We're done with this vessel. Goodbye. And she explodes. Amelia, well, they got the baby that she was going to have. They got it out of her. It ended up killing her. Okay. Killing all the medical staff that was in the room. Eisenhower takes it upon himself. Don't worry, I'll go in and go get it. They start shooting at this little alien hybrid thing. Mamie, she's talking to Richard Nixon. She's telling him some files that Eisenhower has hidden somewhere. This meeting is hush hush. Do not tell him about this. She's all for this alien treaty. I need you to get him to sign it. He doesn't know about the treaty at this point until Mamie tells him about it. And she ends up giving him a handkerchief some point in their meeting when they see each other. God, because he's brought up signing the treaty and whatnot. He's like, how the f do you know about that? Pulls out the handkerchief. Eisenhower is like, so you went and saw my wife? <laughs> Home and questions Mamie about how she found out about all this. He sees that Mamie has become a test subject. Her eyes start glowing white. She starts floating and she's like, we're here. The alien subject now is threatening to kill Mamie if he doesn't sign. That's going on right now. Now we're gonna come back over to 2021 again. Unfortunately, we're back over here. <clears throat> they go to Jamie's OBGYN, get ultrasounds. Doctor is looking at Jamie's. She's like, I need to go. I'll be right back. In kind of a panic, Candle gets Troy to lay down on the table and she's like, I'm gonna look for myself. And they see it's like a half alien human hybrid sort of thing, almost fully grown fetus inside of him. Then they're like, well, how, how are we gonna get this out of us? Then we see the doctor is in another room and she's calling for people to be like, um, this is a fucking emergency. I don't know what the hell's going on. Y'all need to get here. We see some agents. It's the men in black with their little bing thing. And they shoot her. They shoot the doctor. They scoop all of them up, sedate them get them out of there. Candle wakes up. She's in a room surrounded by the friends and a couple other people and they're kind of suspended. Where the f And she's trying to wake everybody up. Someone comes in. Her name is Theta. I'm telling her to shut the hell up. She's wearing a mask actually, but I feel like I should just go ahead and show you what she looks like. She says, this room is a safe space for while you guys are prepped for the next stage, that they're gonna help repopulate the planet. She just waves her hand and Candle goes back to sleep. But later on, Candle's in the dining hall. Her friends come up. They're all eating like these gelatin cubes. And we see a woman, Calico. Leslie, what's her name? Leslie something? Puts on the worst Southern accent I've ever heard in my life. I'm not getting you. Every other word she tried, she tried to have a Southern infliction, but she couldn't keep it up. And Calico comes over and joins them. She explains that she was a prostitute, dancer in Vegas, like a showgirl, and that she has been brought to, they call this place the Mindscape, for decades. Then Troy is asking, ask Calico, he's like, how does this baby plan to come out of me? I ain't pushing it through my wiener. <laughs> this is like, this is what Malcolm says in, in Jurassic Park. Oh, well, uh, life. Life uh, finds a way. And then one of the hosts that's walking around the cafeteria sedating Troy. 
and they take him away because it's time for him to push it out. Say, so you're going into labor, boy. Fetus is starting to claw its way and eat its way through his abdomen. Theta comes in there and tells him that he will be rewarded for all of this pain he's about to go through. Then the episode ends, and then the next episode, 1957, Eisenhower is watching with a bunch of other people of other UFO sightings. For three years, they've had 298 sightings, and people are going missing left and right. You see a UFO appear outside on the south lawn. This guy. His name is Valiant Thor and he says that he's a liaison for the alien race so that he's an android thing and he's been brought to create a hybrid species. He shows something that looks like an iPod touch showing them technology and they're like dude throughout the vents they hear a scream so they go down to the basement thor tells them like well we weren't expecting you to for a, a couple more weeks so excuse the mess excuse our pixie dust while we clean up so 20 stories down underneath the ground they find out that the tunnels were built years before prep for a nuclear war we see several jars and tubes of specimen thor says that the aliens are worried that eisenhower and in turn the human race would abandon the treaty if they saw the aliens in their true form Eisenhower talking to Mamie and Mamie says that Thor has talked to her about it being super crowded in those tunnel systems and they need a bigger space. Can we move our stuff out to Area 51? He's like, yeah, go ahead, I guess. And later on that evening, he sees that his wife, Mamie, and Thor are having sex. It makes him pass out. She is so unapologetic. She's like, anyways, well, yeah, I know what you saw. Revenge for an affair that he had back in the war. 1962. Well, that sucks. Marilyn Monroe on tape talking about a aliens, alien treaty. Everything that JFK told her. The tape is being watched by Eisenhower and Nixon and they're like, we have got to shut her up. Eisenhower's like, nobody's gonna believe her. Everybody knows that she's got a drug problem. At the time, everybody just thought she was some dumb blonde. Marilyn in her bed. We see the suited men come in there and stage her death and she is dead. It's another conspiracy theory. The government killed Monroe. Nixon, he's drunk and he's calling JFK because this was the year before he died. He says, my condolences, but nobody's supposed to know that he was having an affair with her. Maybe next time in the future when you're in bed with your next lover, maybe don't tell them everything. Good night. <laughs> 1963, Eisenhower, Nixon, and now President Lyndon B. Johnson. They go to Area 51. Thor is showing Johnson around. Welcome to the warehouse, baby. And that is where it all started at. That's where all of these girly pops are at. Mindscape is just in Area 51. Let's go back over here. Troy, he goes quiet verbally. Theta is talking to him through mind control telepathically. She uses a laser, slices up his abdomen, scoop out this sack, cut it open, and they see a baby human alien thing. Troy's looking at it like, oh my god, that's my baby. They don't explain why, but Theta looks at it and she says, no, the traits are not right. She ends up slitting the baby's throat, putting it in some like formaldehyde. We'll keep it to do some testing on it. But she says it's the closest hybrid attempt that they've ever gotten so far. Troy is like fucking beside himself he goes back to the cafeteria and his friends find him they cut the baby out of me and killed it right in front of me calico is hearing them talk because they're wanting to try to escape she tells him about what happened with her 1969 he has produced two or three offspring every year since 1969 i did the math for you it's between 110 and 165 hybrids in that whole time nobody has been able to escape i'm going to take you all somewhere to the set of the moon landing that's a big conspiracy the moon landing was faked tells them about how it was staged in 69 up actually with buzz aldrin and neil armstrong at a bar when they're supposed to be orbiting the planet nope, they were down here having a beer she says during that night though was scooped up by the agents the suited men taken to the facility but when she woke up she had an almost full term fetus baby inside of her and she found the moon's set. She said it was being directed by Stanley Kubrick. Kubrick? I never knew how to pronounce his last name. But she said that the landing was to make the public think that we were making giant advances in technology. Later on, we see Cal. He's getting worried because he's like, I'm going into labor now. I don't want them to have this baby. Troy has a scalpel. They go to the moon set. He's like, this is gonna fucking hurt. Carves him open, digs out the baby, and they're like, oh my god can raise it ourselves. The baby spreads some tentacles, latches onto Cal's face, starts chewing his face away, kills Troy, and 
count. 1972, what's going on? Oh, you know, the Vietnam War. So we've got some anti-war protesters outside of the White House. Who's president now? Richard Nixon. Thor is still there telling him, no, we need the war as a distraction because we're snatching up people, using them for the experiments so that they're not paying attention to us. He's like, well, the war can't last for 50 f***ing years. The war will end, but we have other things lined up. Horrible tragedies, epidemics, pandemics is gonna happen as distractions. So we've got the Secretary of State, Kissinger. Kissinger? I don't know. Look, if I learned about him in school, it's been 10 years since I've been in school. He's like, yeah, the war needs to happen. But then we pan over and see him and his little reptilian eyes and and a little he's a lizard person that one makes me laugh we're gonna go back to 1969 eisenhower is laying in a hospital bed watching coverage of the war she says that the doctor has told him not to pay attention to that stuff because it's gonna cause him stress he knows about the extraterrestrial reptilian adversaries and then Mamie, she's all about trying to bring back celebrating holidays. I'm bringing back birthday celebrations, Halloween, Thanksgiving, Flag Day. <laughs> New project is to celebrate Evacuation Day. Never heard of Evacuation Day. Me neither. Evacuation of the British from Boston after the Siege of Boston. Thor comes in and he offers Eisenhower, I can give you eternal life if you want it. Just come to Area 51. He's like, uh, no, I'm good. And you guys deserve each other. He dies. He dies. And then Mamie is looking at him. I don't want that to happen to me. You can take me to the facility. 1972. I'm gonna get into the whole Watergate scandal. We've got someone named Gordon Liddy. Nixon tells him that the people close to him don't think that he can handle any of the stress that he's been put under. Nixon tells him to go and survey and get some information. Their version of the Watergate scandal. He goes to the Watergate Hotel. If you've never heard of that, basically they illegally recorded tapes. I don't have time. Just look it up. Look it up yourself. Amy is meeting with someone named Bob Woodward. She meets with him under the pseudonym Deep Throat. Shut up. She picked that name because nobody would suspect such a crude name. But she's only planting info into the media to create conspiracies. Get attention off of Thor and the extraterrestrial experiments. And the plan is to discredit Nixon rather than kill him. They're gonna just discredit him. Resign and step down from office. And Kissinger, he's saying that resignation is the best way to go about doing this. Girl, just get out. Nixon says, well, I'm gonna tell all your secrets. I'm gonna tell all the secrets that we got. Nixon is actually abducted by some aliens, anally probed, sent back down. And he's like, okay, I'm f***ing done. Resigns as the president of the United States. 1979. Oh dear God. It's the year that Mamie dies. Well, in American Horror Story, she actually, she is dead currently, yes. By American Horror Story standards, she's not dead. They faked her death. She brought to Area 51. So she goes into the facility and she ends up meeting Calico and they become besties. <sighs> We're back over here in 2021. So security is looking all over the place for these two. They end up running into all of the rooms, including Mamie's room. She's like, what is going on? But they don't tell her anything. They end up finding both of the boys. Fade is there and they see the hybrid. So the guards go and they shoot at it because it's going to attack. Other guard that's there shoots and kills both of them. The hybrid and the, the guard. Theta, she gets pissed off and she kills the other guard. Don't kill the hybrids, you idiot. Now it's time for Jamie and Kate candle to give birth to their babies. Jamie has her baby. It's not right. They kill it. They kill Jamie. Candle has her baby. Ah, <gasps> the Messiah. It's the one. Delivers the perfect hybrid. It just says, all right, the experiments are over. We're done. Candle says the victory is not going to last long. Theta cutting her head off. She's like, shut up, girl. But then they put this silver orb thing on her head and they say they're going to use her as a breeding machine. Mamie, she's in the facility in present day now. And she's having another birthday, but you know what? It's not fun anymore because she's immortal. And Thor is talking to her. He says, we're gonna clone the breeder's womb, populate the, the planet, no problem. This is where it gets really stupid because Mamie's like, well, I didn't know about that. I didn't know that was a part of the plan. Bitch, what did you think was gonna happen? Thor also says that the treaty signed by the reptilian race, they're gonna join together the reptilian race and the alien race. And that they are gonna share Earth when the humans are all gone. Genocide and just wipe them all out. Theta invites Mamie into the lab to see the hybrid. She goes and looks at it and she's like, oh God, we figured out a way to speed up the process. Body can pump out a baby a day. We're gonna tweak it a little bit and she can do it. Multiple hybrids 
an hour. Mamie goes and she finds Calico and she says, we have got to, we gotta go destroy that machine. Candle. And we gotta destroy the newborn, the hybrid. She goes to try and kill the newborn. He's frozen in place by Theta. She kills Mamie. She makes her head explode. Calico, she's promised to be spiritual mother of all of the children. And that's it. That's all. Okay, so here's the issue. One, why? Second of all, <laughs> uh, just st stupid. A lot of people thought, oh, maybe this is the show that Harry was writing. But as it goes on, it's just like, no, it's not. Joaquin Phoenix was supposed to be in it. He ain't in it. I started thinking, well, they kept saying that he was writing the best script of his life or the best thing that anybody's ever heard. This is sh- <laughs> this is it. Their acting is terrible. Her southern accent is arse. If they had stuck with this side, I could have handled that. This is the worst rated season, part of the season, I guess. Altogether, double feature. I think I'm gonna give it like a 2.3 just for, for Red Tide. If it had to come down to like COVID restrictions of them rewriting stuff, I would have rather them just wait another year and put it out later. I don't get it, but if I'm not connecting the dots here, let me know. I've tried to look it up on Reddit threads and Twitter threads. Everybody's pretty much like, yeah, I don't get it. <laughs> get one more good look at my bald head. I'm sweating like a hooker in church under here. I'm gonna wrap this up because I've been standing on my feet three and a half hours. I want to uh, sit down. <laughs> I'll be back with season 11. I'll see you very soon. I'll see you in a second. Hey, I don't know. I tried. I just tried something. I, I didn't have anything to wear for this. This is the best we're getting. Welcome to season... 11. I'm really not gonna spend too much time talking around this, get into the story because truthfully, I don't care about this season all that much. I feel like this is a season that gets forgotten by most people. And hear a lot of people talking about it. You know it's a good season when there's memes coming out of it. And there was no, nothing that I saw. American Horror Story, NYC. <laughs> off the bat. I'm really giving this the benefit of the doubt. 2.2. I think it's all right. This one felt the most un-American horror story season. Does that make sense? Hardly any of the original cast is there, except for one, Dennis O'Hare. Zachary Quinto's in this, but he was only in the first two seasons. I think it has moments where it's got a decent storyline, but overall it's just, it's forgetful. This season is going to talk a lot about sex, STDs, and sexual abuse, bondage, BDSM. So if that triggers you, you can skip this part. You're not missing much. You're like, this is my belt. I think I've had this belt since I was like 14. It's the only sort of leathery thing that I have. All right, let's get started. Stop talking. Shut up. 1981. And obviously taking place in New York City. First opening scene, the flight crew that has come into the city. It's like Pan Am. Flight attendants out of the taxi and the pilot. They go into a hotel. One of the flight attendants starts hitting on the pilot. He's like, I'm married, but thank you. He goes to his hotel room and he opens up his luggage and he puts on Looks like one of the village people. Some leather, some dark sunglasses. He goes to a warehouse on the Hudson Pier. We see somebody watching him. Leatherface. <sighs> and the pilot finds a glory hole. <laughs> well, the next morning, we meet Detective Patrick Reed. Can I say something really quick? The whole time I was watching this season, I kept watching him. Who the hell is this? At first I was like, is he related to Matthew Lillard? They're not. And he was in this one show that I watched. It came out in like 2008. Anybody knows about it. It's called Being Human. If you know that, you are honorary sweaty award to you because I've never met anybody that knows that show. It's actually really good though. He's a detective of the NYPD. He is out investigating dismembered body that's been found. The pilot. Headless body in leather pants. Pants. No ID, but they found a matchbook in his pockets from one of the gay bars around the city called the Brownstone. And now we have another character. Hannah. Yes, her name is Hannah. She is a doctor. She's a biologist. Looking at some blood samples. At some, a mutating contagion from some of the deer on Fire Island. Symptoms in deer ticks include seizures, skin infections, and liver failure. She's out on Fire Island with the police officer and a mayor. She's telling them that the disease could spread amongst the entire population. Sorry. <laughs> the population population of the deer possibly spread to humans to start hunting them down. So back in the city, a sanitation worker he's unclogging a drain. He sees a severed head. They can't conclude right away if the head belongs to the other body. The medical examiner pulls out a handkerchief, a dark blue handkerchief. Isn't this an indication? Gay. <laughs> well, I'll talk more about it in just a second. The audience soon finds out. Patrick here, he's a queer. He lacks penis. The medical examiner says that the handkerchief was probably 
put in, well, not probably, it was put in the person's throat after they had died. So now we've got three lesbians. <laughs> I know they mentioned their names in the show. The other characters are not really important other than Fran. Fran is like the leader of this group of gals. She goes to a local newspaper called the National Gay Newspaper and they're looking for Gino Borelli, the editor-in-chief or whoever. He's in charge of the whole thing. And they chew him out because they're, you only write about gay men. What about us lesbians over here? What the heck? Basically just gives him a roundabout answer and he's like, well, I don't have any perspective for you lesbians out there. I'm a man and I like penis. I don't like the puss too much. Right after that scene, Gino goes home to Patrick. They're dating. He tells Patrick that his precinct has more complaints from the gay community about being homophobic and he encourages Patrick to come out. It would be helpful for the entire gay community if you were out. They're talking about the dead body and Patrick says like, well, I can't go on record about any of this. We're going to meet another character. This is Adam. You know what is so funny? I don't know if anybody else cares. Ryan Murphy, he's got so many shows and I can kind of pinpoint throughout American Horror Story. I can tell like what phase he's going through. Apocalypse, I can tell he was doing American Crime Story. Is there a lot of the cast is the same? In this, I can tell he was doing Ratchet. We got Adam here. Dawson! We got Dawson here! He's really bummed out because his partner broke his heart. His friend and roommate, Sully, come on, why don't you come out with me to be my backup for tonight? I gotta sell these drugs, these quaaludes. And they go to a spot out in Central Park. Adam realizes, what the hell? This is like a big orgy. What did you take me to? A cruising spot for hookups and whatnot. Sully, he's, he goes off with another guy. Adam is just wandering around like, Adam sees Leatherface and he gets scared. He runs off and he's looking for Sully. He hears Sully start screaming. Then Sully ends up running in to Leatherface. So then Adam is at the police station giving a report about what happened to his friend. Patrick is taking the report. Adam can kind of get the feeling that Patrick doesn't really give a sh Patrick tells him about other dead bodies that they've been finding. He's trying to make connections between the two of them. Because he also can't do anything because it's only been 12 hours. And he says there's also no evidence of a crime. Patrick talks to his police chief. Chief Mananza or I don't know. But we're just going to call him chief. Voicing his concerns about the bodies popping up everywhere. But the chief, he says, most of the gays come to New York to get away and to not be found. So yeah, don't worry about it. They don't even want to be found. We're going to another club sort of thing called the Neptune Bats. A club singer by the name of Kathy Pizzazz. He's up there singing Fever. Adam, he's at this uh, Neptune Baths. He asks a friend Morris for advice, but Morris says that Sully will show back up eventually. Like they're all being very nonchalant about it. At the bar, Adam sees a picture of what looks like Leatherface and he's like, who the hell, who is that? What is this? Bartender's like, well, I, I have no idea who that is, but I know who took the picture. Photographer, Theo Graves. That sounds like a emo punk boy or like a wrestler. He sounds like a Corey Graves lip. They could be brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Gino is also at this club. He's listening into Adam and Morris's conversation. The killer and Sully going missing and whatnot. So before Adam leaves, Gino is like, you can talk to me if you want. I run a newspaper. <laughs> I might publish everything you're saying. He gives him his card and he's like, come see me if you want to talk. Adam, he eventually goes to see Theo at his studio. Theo's in the middle of doing a photo shoot. He shows them all his pictures. They're very provocative. He also talks about having a psychic gift that he got from his grandma. Anyway, he keeps saying like, I have these premonitions that something's gonna happen. Like, no shit. I'm sorry. If you believe in all that zodiac and horoscope energies and whatnot, good for you. I wish I was like you, but I don't. <laughs> when I hear stuff like that, I'm like, what are you smoking? <laughs> People are so vague. Also, I feel like something is coming. I can just sense it. No shit. Something's coming. Everything's coming. My DoorDash is coming. So Theo tells Adam he'll talk to him. The picture he took. Leatherface if he poses for some pictures for him. A little naked. He takes off his shirt. He reveals the name. Everybody called this man Big Daddy. I'm not going to be calling him that. But he says that nobody's heard from him or seen him since those pictures were taken. Someone else enters the room. Sam. And this is Theo's boyfriend, partner, pimp. The work we're doing. The photos, they're not cutting it anymore. Not to pay these bills and especially our cocaine addiction. <laughs> we need more money. Patrick tells Gino that you gotta watch yourself because my boss is on to me. The stories are leaking. Of course I'm the source. Don't leak anything about a potential killer. I know you're snooping. This is where they talk about the dark blue handkerchief. Handkerchiefs, color-coded handkerchiefs show like a sexual preference what people are into. Dark blue means you like anal. I think you like to receive anal or something like that. Depends on like what pocket you put 
put it in lord i don't know he asked gino to go ask around the brownstone you remember that was the club that the dead body had a matchbook from then we see patrick out at a cafe with his ex-wife barbara and they're talking about their divorce patrick did come out to barbara now they're filing for divorce they want to keep it civil and they still want to be friends but barbara she's pretty hurt about it but gino is at the brownstone then he sends a drink over to henry Dennis O'Hare, you are holding this series together. And they're talking about the gay community and everything going wrong with it. Have you seen anybody? Do you think there's anybody here? Henry starts talking about a man, talks up to less desirable men, leaves with them. The men that he leaves the bar with are usually never seen again. Suspect number one, number Juan. Then Henry says the victims all drink Mai Tais that are ordered for them by this person. He also tells Gino, don't put my name in this story. I don't want my name on the news. You keep my name out of it. Gino, you are such a whistleblower. I'm just now realizing, good Lord. Gino, he gets up to leave, but then he realizes Someone has spiked his drink and he's getting all wobbly. Well, then he's helped out to a car by someone. So Sam, he arranges a photo shoot with an up and coming actor, Theo, to take pictures of him naked to sell around. Young man is like, well, I really, I want to be a serious actor. Sam convinces him, this will open the door for you. Just do this for me. You'll have an endless amount of possibilities. Oh, Freddy, that was the guy's name. I knew I wrote it down. Sam says, we need to spice things up a little bit. He brings out a stool leg lube it up and shove it up your ass he tells theo i want these pictures for my own personal collection and theo is also asking sam about the leather face have you seen him sam's like no i think he died <laughs> theo goes and meets up with adam again at the neptune baths and he tells him leather face he's dead adam is like no i know this person is who i saw out in central park he can't be dead i just saw him freddie the one that was getting the pictures taken of goes into a steam room at one of the baths and he sees leather faces in there oh cool Christ on a stick. Gino, he wakes up in a random apartment somewhere, hazily seeing who took him. This is why I didn't really love this season is because they gave up the killer right away. I don't like that. I want to figure it out and then be shocked at the end when I get it wrong. <laughs> it's a man named Whiteley measuring out plastic wrap to put around Gino, the mess they're about to create. He is bound and gagged with a dark blue hanky. Oh my God. You're going to ram it up his butthole? Whiteley, he tells him the plan. I got to read it from my notes because I don't know what the f he was talking about. It didn't make any sense to me. He wants to display his body as a clear symbol of recognizable homosexuals rather than just random parts. Basically trying to sew different parts of gay men together. So he starts to undress Gino and he notices Gino has a Marine Corps tattoo over his heart and Whiteley is like, you've already served your country. Never mind. Let me pack you back. <laughs> he sedates him and puts him back to sleep. Gino wakes up later. He's in some like arcade, stumbles out to the street and passes out. Now Hannah, she's at the hospital and she's examining a blood sample. Sam's blood sample and she goes to meet with him and she tells him got a rare amoeba called cryptosporidium but she thinks it's a sexually transmitted disease but she's seen four cases this month you know it's a rare thing to have but she's already seen four uh-huh what's going on she gives him some antibiotics and she's like just don't have sex for like three or four days ma'am do you know what this this fella does on his off days? <laughs> so then a couple of other patients out in the waiting room. One of them is the lesbian girls from the group. Also, Whiteley is sitting out there. And when Whiteley is called back, he says, look, I got a rash and it ain't going anywhere. Now, okay, cut on that scene. Adam going to see Gino at the paper. And then Gino, he's a bit frazzled. You know, he just had one wild night trying to write down his experience that he just had. He can publish in the paper. Obviously, the police are not going to help at all. He's upset about that. Adam, he says, you know what? We should make a hotline for all these reports coming in. We can jot down their story about what they've experienced. If they've had a traumatic experience like Gino, if they see this leather man, then we can publish those stories so that they have an outreach. Gino ends up hiring Adam to work for the paper, work for the national. Is that what it's called? The native, not the national. We got the three lezzies are back. Fran is leading the pack. Uh, same thing. Like he's not posting any posting. <laughs> He's not publishing any stories about, it's only one-sided frustration. He's like, fine, you guys can have this desk over here and you write whatever you want. He starts posting flyers all over the city about this hotline. Well, then he gets detained by the police. Police, police. Adam is sitting at the precinct, questioned and hazed basically all the detectives in the office. And we also meet another detective. I'm gonna have such a hard time pronouncing his name. Mulcahy, Mulcahy, Mulcahy. They're basically like, what the? Stop posting shit around the town. Patrick also, he reminds Adam, he's like, I am the one that took your statement about your friend. Adam's like, yeah, you didn't really seem to f 
didn't care though. <laughs> Patrick, he says something like, the leather community is usually benign and harmless. And everybody starts looking at him like, at the chief, he says that the police are bound by the limits of the law. What the fuck? What are you talking about? They open the door and they show this guy walk in wearing a jock strap, a cowboy hat, and he slaps the sh out of Adam. Mulcahy, he's like, you need to take back what you said on that interview you have with Gino and stop spreading stuff about this guy. Shut the hell up. Then Adam's like, no. <laughs> they put him in a holding cell. Patrick comes in there. He's like, look, I'll get you out of here in just a little bit, but you have got to just stay out of our way, please. Adam calls him out. He's like, does anybody here know that you're gay? You, uh, I was gonna make a joke. I can't think of anything right now. <laughs> Patrick, he kind of plays dumb. He's like, what? Barbara. She runs into Gino and she gives him a box. Look, I was clearing out the closet and I have some of Patrick's old stuff. They're not, I don't know. It's very icy between the two of them. The jewelry box that she gives him is full of bandanas, colored bandanas, handkerchiefs, excuse me, and leather and poppers, <laughs> BDSM type things. A little alarming too. She also asks Gino about the article that he published, you know, about his attacker. He says that jealousy is making her paranoid. And she's like, bitch, I live in this neighborhood. I, sh I think I should know there's a killer running around. You know what? Now I'm realizing Gino is, I'm not a fan. Morris, he's picking Adam up. He invites him out to a party at a warehouse. This artistic renaissance, almost cabaret. Renaissance and the cabaret are not the same. <laughs> then they get on the subway to go to this party. They see this crazy woman sitting on the subway and she's like, honey, you got a big storm coming. <laughs> Patrick and Gino are having a dinner. It's very awkward. Gino tells Patrick that Mole Kahi took his statement about his captor, but he didn't really believe him. He was just kind of like, okay. Patrick is like, well, I'll get you in touch with another detective. You can talk to them. But Gino's like, y'all are all the same. You homos. <laughs> you, no, they're not homos. Wait, they're homophobes. Gino suggests that they should go to the leather bar to and What the fuck? Oh my God. That scared the shit out of me. <laughs> he hasn't brought up the, uh, the stuff yet, but he's on to him. There's a man named Stuart. He's offered a Mai Tai, but he doesn't drink it. Then when he goes out, he hears the payphone on the street ringing. So he answers it. We find out it's Sam. What the f was that? Oh, that's my book. I was <laughs> like, what made that noise? Sam on the other end, and he's basically inviting him over to his apartment. Adam and Morris, they're going around this cabaret. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go. Morris is invited on the stage by the MC. Adam leaves. He's like, you know what? Screw this. I don't want to be here anymore. Theo was there and Theo follows him out. The conversation goes that they should both keep it platonic between the two of them. Because if you're involved with Sam, eh, goodbye. Gino and Patrick are out at a gay bar called The Ditch. Gino talks to the manager of the bar. She asks Gino, can you not put my bar in your paper? The bar itself is mob owned. They don't like publicity. Patrick and Gino are sitting back at the bar again and Patrick is like, you know, leather is not my scene. You lie like a rug, Patrick. Gino is like, oh really? Because it's funny, Barbara dropped off this. <laughs> he doesn't do that, but like, well, what about all this bondage shit I found in this jewelry box you have? All the while, while that's going on, there is a man at the end of the bar and he accepts a drink, a Mai Tai. You find out Whiteley is also known as the Mai Tai killer. Whiteley is standing behind him. We don't see him, but we can hear him. <laughs> and he stabs him in the neck. Then Patrick goes into police mode. Hans, who was at the warehouse, and he was one of the MCs, him and a friend are walking home from the party. He's carrying a cat, and they feel like they're being watched. Well, they are. They don't see him, but Leatherface is behind him, watching him. Hannah, she's given reports into her little tape recorder about Whiteley's rash that she took samples from, and she IDs it as Kaposi's sarcoma. Then Fran interrupts her and calls her and says, meet me out here at Central Park. I gotta talk to you about something. Hannah goes out there. behind her her, she sees Leatherface. Um, the hell? But then she runs into Fran. Leatherface is gone. Fran, she says the disease, the disease is an attack conducted by the government. She says she was a lab assistant in Operation Paperclip. The government conducted experiments in 1952 that tested contaminants and animal hosted diseases on human population. A facility on Plum Island developed a weaponized strain that could hide the mucous membranes for use in the Cold War. Poor people, they volunteered in exchange for money. And then it became an infection. Hannah says, symptoms that keep popping up. These symptoms should be very rare, but I'm seeing them all over the place. She's like, just be careful writing this story. You don't want to spread conspiracy theories or false truths and worry the public. Sam, he's at his apartment and he goes down to the basement. We see Stuart, the one that he called from the payphone. He put him in a cage. Gotten past the point of sex at this point. He's like, I would like to leave. And then Sam just says, well, I'm not done with you. 
And then Gino keeps thinking that Patrick is holding something back from him, which you know, he probably is Gino because you run your mouth too much. Patrick is called to another crime scene. His chief is there and there are six separate hands and they're lined up on like a chain across the ceiling. Stuart, he ends up waking up, the cage is open and he walks out and sees other face. He's still standing there like, he's like, I just want to leave, but he doesn't answer. And so then he's like, and he walks right past him and out onto the street. Patrick interviews Stuart after he's gone to report what Sam did to him. Patrick is like, these claims don't match up with the other killings and reports that we've been having. But then Patrick ends up going to a party, Theo and Sam's house. Sam takes Patrick to the basement. They look at the cage and Sam is like, well, everything was consensual. He agreed to come here. And then Patrick goes home and he talks to Gino about Sam's little dungeon thing that he has. Gino's like, that's not where I was at. That doesn't sound like the room I was in. Gino actually went to an artist sketch sketch artist and <laughs> had them draw what he remembers his captor looking like. Patrick says, well, your mental state, I mean, you were drugged. It probably can't hold up. You end up fighting and arguing. I don't know. Y'all are not good together. Like he's like, we need to have a stakeout where Stuart was picked up at, you know, with the payphone. You go do it. You can go stand out there. Patrick goes out to this payphone all night long. He's getting random calls, mostly wrong numbers. Then one of the calls that he gets, when you can tell from the voice, it's Whiteley. It leads him to that warehouse where like the cabaret people are at. He goes and to a room with someone that he thinks is the leather face or at least he thinks the person that gave him the call it wasn't go into this back room the back rooms of tiktok and they have thick patrick starts whipping the sh out of him we see hans you remember the one took the cats home anyway he's out in the subway waiting we see him lift up his shirt sleeve and we see the rash on his skin but he's like oh my god these and cats. He also sees that crazy lady out on the subway hooting and hollering again. Gina goes to the ditch, that one bar that just had that guy die in with the sketch that he's gotten drawn out. He gives it to the manager and he's like, can I post this somewhere? And she's like, fine. He looks at the sketch and she says, oh yeah, I know who that is. He's a Vietnam vet and he's a regular in here all the time. Adam goes to something called the Ascension Club. Woman. My name is Dunaway. Who the hell are you? This is a members only. I was like, well, yeah, I'm meeting Theo. And she's like, oh, bitch, I know who Theo is. He asks if he can post some of the flyers up and she's like, no, <laughs> no, you cannot. Theo ends up coming in and we see Leatherface is watching from the outside. Adam keeps saying he really believes that Big Daddy, he really believes that the Leatherface is still alive and that Sam knows about it. They get served two drinks, two Mai Tais from a guy at the end of the bar. Well, they go and look at the end of the bar. No one's there. And then Dunaway, she's walking around and she's like, what the hell? We're all locked locked in. All the doors are locked. We see Leatherface. He throws a lit fire across the bar. Lights the whole place on fire. He's burning this place down to the ground. He turns and leaves. Puts a chain on the door and locks everybody in there. Gino shows Henry a police sketch. He says that he was there the night before and Henry didn't call the police because why bother? Gino also brings up the last time I was in here with you. I was drugged and then held captive and almost chopped up. What's going on there? Henry denies any involvement. And you know what? Gino's just like Oh, okay. Hannah, she is talking to another doctor. She's like, I think we need to enact some testing on gay men out them knowing for contagion she sees rising. The boss is like, no, we can't do that. That's unethical and illegal. And anyway, so then she's leaving the hospital. All of the victims of the Ascension Club fire are being brought in and one of them is Whiteley. He was there and he bought the Mai Tais and she goes to a payphone and but she's calling somebody and she's like, get me 15 blood panel kit things. Fast, now. Theo, he's got some burns he's treated for. Adam has sno snoke, smoke inhalation. He starts freaking out and getting agitated and they kind of detain him and restrain him down. Adam is like, go get Gino and tell him what the f just happened. Patrick and Gino end up at the hospital to see what is going on. They figured out that Whiteley is there and they're like, where is this patient? Where did he go? The doctor that's helping treat all these victims, she's like, I don't know. He got up and left. So then they're running around. Hannah, she goes to see Adam after he's done freaking the hell out and she takes off his restraints and they have a little conversation and he says, God, you're glowing like a pregnancy glow. Yeah, Hannah's pregnant. Did you know that? No, because they never talked about it. <laughs> and then he says he feels good about what they did. Basically, he was a sperm donor for her to have a baby. That's what I mean. This season is just so like, oh yeah, and this happened. No backstory, no nothing. Hannah leaves and she goes and she sees Whiteley walking around and she's like, um, can I get some blood samples from you? So he sits down. He's kind of like, can we hurry up? Because I've got somewhere to be. People are chasing me. Hannah gets some samples. He ends up just running out of the room. Gino sees him, starts chasing him around the hospital. For some reason, end up in the 
the morgue and they fight each other for a bit but who cares whitely ends up getting gino on a slab and sliding him into one of the shelf thingies the cubbies i don't know what you call them and locks him in there yelling for patrick or for somebody to come get him it's also freezing in there because they got to keep the bodies cold and patrick is upstairs and he sees whitely walking through the hospital from the other side of the hallway and he kind of gives him a look like catch me if you can mother start running around cat and mouse game again long story long patrick ends up going down to the morgue and he finds gino pulls him out and gets him out okay well the next morning gino he keeps scratching at this rash he accuses patrick of bringing home fleas you went and laid around with other people these leather bars it's also worth noting that this was the hot not it, not the hottest day ever recorded but in their season it is i think the hottest day recorded in new york city like they had that 25 hour blackout 1970 something gino is reading out Adam's first article that he's published, but he says, I need you to get f***ing angry. Use your name, call people out, get angry. He's talking about the, his encounters with Leatherface. At the Neptune Baths, Kathy, she hires a singer, looks like her, it's like, a, what do you call it? A tribute artist. And then Gino comes in there asking for an interview with Kathy. She agrees to defend the community, but is not sure how much it will help during these times. Illnesses are becoming more common. That's what I wrote. That's straight from my notes, if you wanted to know. McCall... Mokahe and Patrick investigate a messy crime scene where we see Hans. Remember him? He was one of the MCs, the cat thing. Yeah, whatever. He is now a rotting corpse. Friend or partner? We see the partner coming downstairs and he's freaking out. I don't know. He's shocked and he's shook up. And he looks like he's been injured as well. Had some slashes and blunt force trauma to him. They find Hans laying in the bed, rotting away. He's got these lesions and rash his medical examiner says that the skin lesions are actually making it a lot more complicated to know like what the cause of death is. He says, we're going to wait for an autopsy before we start accusing anybody. He ends up calling Gino. Y'all can't keep your damn mouth shut. So Theo, he's going home from the hospital. Remember, he was just in that fire. He's in Sam's apartment. And Sam is like, were you out cheating? But he's like, no, actually, I was just in a fire and then he asks about the men that he's been keeping captive like Stuart but he's starting to become really afraid of Sam he's asking Theo he's like do you think I could be the killer and then Theo's like I mean <laughs> Theo is out and he goes to see Adam at his apartment well right outside the apartment we see yet again Leatherface Theo goes up there and he tells Adam I want to be with you I'm done with Sam they have thick all night long. When they wake up, Adam goes to his answering machine. He hears this awful message. Wait, just somebody growling out of nowhere. The power goes out. It's a blackout, love. It starts with Adam's apartment. As these next scenes go, it goes like doom, doom, doom. His phone rings and it's Morris and he invites them both to come out to the warehouse. The chief calls in Patrick. He's upset. The native keeps getting these stories leaked, putting us on blast. Well, then Patrick, he's just like, you know, I'm gay. <laughs> He comes out as gay to his boss. He also says, I'm also a decorated police officer. So you can't take that away from me. Their power goes out too. Conversation is cut. Barbara, she's back. She confronts Gino. Gives him a leather hood, much like that one that Leatherface is wearing, and saying that it was Patrick. She tells Gino that she's afraid that Patrick is actually involved in these killings. She begs Gino to get the truth out of Patrick. Patrick gets a call from Whiteley and his partner. I'm not going to try and say your name right now. They go out to Central Park because they go and they find a payphone but they're attacked by a hooded figure. When they look that the hooded figure is gone, Whiteley is starting to hunt down another victim. Morris has invited Adam and Theo out to the warehouse. They're really there to mourn and pay respect to Hans. Adam says, yeah, there's a killer going around. Police aren't doing anything. Although there has not been any evidence that the leather man, the leather face, has hurt anybody. We need to form a resistance organization. Patrick has gone back home and he tells Gino that he's come out to his boss. Aren't you happy that I came out? What you wanted? Well, then Gino is like, um, what's up with this hood that Barbara brought over? Explain that. <laughs> now check that. And anyway, he admits to having an affair. He is into the bondage leather scene. Gino calls him out. He only admits the truth when he's about to be caught. <laughs> well, this isn't funny. Gino works himself up so much that he gives himself a heart attack. <laughs> the doctors tell him that it was caused by a fever. The doctor asks if they own a cat and they're like, what? No. And she says, well, it could have been caused by something called cat scratch fever, which side note, I went to the, <laughs> this was a couple years ago, but I had like swollen lymph nodes. Long story long, it was because I got veneers, but I had like needles and numbing stuff put into my gums. I went to a patient first and they said, you might have cat scratch fever. And I said, what the f is 
that? Well, you know, a cat can scratch you and spread little infections around. I said, ah, oh, I haven't had a cat in 10 years. It was because the needles went into my gums. It made my lymph nodes swell up. My neck was huge. I don't know, when I heard that in this season, I said, I know what that is. <laughs> Side note, I'm so sorry to get distracted. And she says that the fever is flea born. Gino does give Patrick quite the dirty look. Sleeping around, huh? From one of your affairs, you whore. Daniel and Cameron, they're some of the people from the warehouse. They see Whiteley. Whiteley is carrying a severed head. They follow him to one of the only powered areas. They get into an elevator that Whiteley is holding open for them. Why the hell would you do that? He knows that they know what's in his bag, the head. Powers start flickering on and off in the elevator. It has like a knife up in the air and the power's flickering and we can only just assume he strikes. Kathy watching her new replacement tribute act, singing a song, Witchcraft. Do y'all know that one? You would know it if you heard it. Kathy's watching and she's kind of cringing. She's like, oh, no, just stop. Take five. Well, it was actually kind of a callback to Coven because if you remember, she plays Joan in Coven. Bible thumping, God fearing Christian woman. She was like, which is, no, 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 no. It's kind of a callback to that. The tribute act is singing about witchcraft and she's like, ah, stop. Fran, walking down the street, she wanders into a psychic shop that is owned by Kathy. What do I have to do to work here? And Kathy's like, you don't have to do it. It's not real. Make it up. So then Fran goes home. She studies the card. Her girlfriend is like, don't get too deep into this. And she's like, girl, it ain't even real. Outside the apartment, Leatherface is watching. Adam and Hannah going to the psychic because they're talking about if it could be a boy or a girl. Fran's in there. She starts to give him a reading. It's going not good because she's like, I, I don't even know what this one means. And Adam cuts the cards. He's asking about his missing friend, Sully. Fran ends up pulling up the death card and she's like, then, 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 wait a minute. That doesn't mean he's dead. Hannah shuffles the cards. It's another death card. They keep dealing out all these cards. All of them are death. And they get frustrated and upset. So then they leave. Fran goes, she shuffles the cards again and looks at them all and they're all back to normal. Patrick and her face, Barbara, are finally signing the divorce papers. She looks rough. She looks sick as hell. Barbara signs first and while Patrick is signing, Barbara passes the hell out. <laughs> she wakes up in the hospital and Patrick's there and she says, I'm sorry to do this. I got a dog. I haven't let him out since yesterday morning or whenever. Can you go over there and check on him? He goes over there and when he gets into the apartment, he hears a noise and then he ends up seeing Leatherface. Now this is the first time we have physical contact with Leatherface. <laughs> and Patrick ends up getting knocked out. Well then they wake up Mulcahy. He's like, is this a threesome that Barbara set up? Or some gone wrong. And then Barbara comes back home and he says, I don't want to leave you here. He says, you know, I'm fine. There's a patrol car outside. Adam is walking around the hospital and he passes Whiteley. You know, he doesn't even know who he is. So he just walks right past him. An ultrasound appointment for Hannah and the baby. And the doctor says that he's concerned about her red blood cell count, but it's probably just chalked up to anemia. Hannah tells Adam, I took samples from all the burn victims and all of them had a lot had a low red blood cell count and I'm showing some other symptoms that are very similar. Adam goes and tells Theo about the blood cell thing. Theo is like, let's go see Fran again at the psychic shop and let's get you a better reading. Then they start dealing out the cards again. First one is judgment, death, and the devil. Then the room starts shaking. Adam runs out and then Adam goes and he tells Gino about the psychic shop. You should go get a reading from her. <laughs> like because you had such a positive experience? No. Anyway, but Gino goes to the shop but instead of Fran doing the reading, Kathy comes out and she does a reading for Gino. They keep pulling out the same cards, the judgment, death, and the devil. But then, oh God, bestie, I, when this came on, I said, well, who is that? We see the kiss of death. Do you remember the kiss of death from Asylum? Her name is actually, oh gosh, I don't know how to say it. Shaka, But she's like the angel of death. She plants a wet one on you, gives you a little kiss, takes your life. She shows up, but it's not Frances Conroy. I want that to be known. She is not in this season. And that is probably why y'all did not get a point. It spooks Gino, he up and leaves. He's at home later, he sees the sarcoma. Barbara, she's back home. She's in the shower. We see Leatherface come up and strangle her. She dies. So Patrick comes in, runs outside actually, and he's f***ing fuming because the patrol car is sitting out there and he's like, you guys weren't watching. She's dead. Home and he's crying. And while Gino's holding him, Gino also sees that he's got some sarcoma lesions all over him. 
This is bad news bears. So Whiteley, he had the two boys, Cameron and Daniel, uh, that followed him into the elevator. He didn't kill them, but he's got them like strapped up to some slabs. I'm going to read this straight from the notes because this is a part of his little plan that I don't even, I don't get it, but wants to unveil something at the pride parade to expose shallow hypocrisy in favor of something honest. He lowers this thing. It looks like Jesus coming down. It's like IV bags all over it. It's a sentinel from body parts from some of his kills and sews them together makes a monster. He's like Frankenstein. But he says he's missing a heart and genitals. The most important parts. <laughs> Alright, so now we've got two men that are on Fire Island. This is the top of the episode. They are f***ing out on the beach. And then one of them feels like he got bit by something. They start digging around in the sand and they pull up a skull with a leather mask on it. We have Gino and Patrick, I just forgot his name for a second, asking Hannah about blood samples that she took at the Ascension fire. She's like, I can't talk about that. And then she sees Gino sarcoma. She's like, did you get that looked at yet? I'm starting to see that pop up all over the place. I've only ever seen it on gay men and Italian men. But then Gino is like, it's not that big of a deal. It's just a bug bite. I'm fine. Well, Patrick goes into work and now starts the hazing. He's now out as gay. They start giving him the side eye like, Okay, he, he starts questioning him. Have you been bringing that sketch around the hospital? Because the staff is getting spooked out. They think he's a part of the staff. He just tells him like, shut up, leave it alone. Leave it alone. You don't know what you're talking about. Maybe you should go back to making those gay homophobic remarks. Noted, Macaulay Culkin has never made a remark. He actually tells him, he's like, you don't know jack shit. Meaning like, I don't give a f who you like. I don't care how you like to take it up your ass. Patrick gets a call from one of those two guys that found the skull and they say, we heard from a friend of a friend that you're the one to call because you're gay. Tell him like what they found, the skeleton with the hood on it and don't tell anybody till I get there. And then he calls up Sam. Why? Because Sam and Patrick, they have already known each other for a while. But while that's happening, we're gonna come back to that in just a second. Henry is out meeting with one of the mom members that owns these clubs. And he's basically telling him, can you get Gino to shut the f up? If he keeps going like this, we are going to strike. Henry's like, yeah, I'll get him to stop find out that actually Henry is working with the mob. Now Patrick and Sam, they're going out to Fire Island, packing up, and he tells Gino that, that Gino can't come. And then Gino's just assuming that he's having an affair. He follows him out and sees that he gets in the car with Sam, goes back into his apartment. Henry's in there with a gun. Shut up. Stop printing stories in the newspaper. But he also gets curious. Gino mentions the body that they just found that Patrick's going to look for. Then we see Patrick and Sam going out to the island. Sam looking at what we know is his like beach house. This was the only place where I felt at home and at peace. And Patrick is like, yeah, it's probably from the drugs. And then Sam says, why did we bury him in such shallow sand? Huh? Then Patrick says, again, probably the drugs. What is going on? What are y'all talking about? But then they start digging for other body parts and Gino and Henry show up. We find out also Henry is involved in this too. But then Pat tells Gino, this is not even related to the Mai Tai killer. 1979, Sam and Patrick meet. Patrick goes for a weekend getaway to Fire Island. Sam's beach house, he's having a big house party or whatever. Drugs are flowing, the alcohol is dripping. Nobody's ever said that before. <laughs> Patrick meets a guy named Billy. They both get high on coke for the first time. They both try the booger sugar and Sam takes them. They've got this like post. Billy's like, oh, well, I'll volunteer to receive. They put like a gimp mask on him. Patrick has sex with him. Sam is watching. And after a little bit, Sam is like, rips Patrick away and then they pull off the mask. Well, Billy died. He couldn't breathe. They're both panicking. Sam, he uses that age old excuse. He's like, can't get in trouble because he consented. Sam, he ends up calling Henry, paying Henry $10,000 to get rid of the body. Henry, he knows Whiteley. His assistant is a whiz at cutting up bodies. Whiteley's cutting him up. Henry's watching over him and he gets really disturbed because Whiteley's making some weird ass remarks. He's like, his body is so beautiful. So then back at the beach where they're digging up the body, Patrick is like, you are not getting involved in this. But then Henry is like, well, he's either going to be an accessory to this crime or he's going to go blow the lid off all, all this. Because you know, he can't keep his mouth shut. Then Gino, he starts helping to dig for all the bones and whatnot because the clean cut of the bones that Whiteley is the Mai Tai killer because his bone cutting abilities match up with the Mai Tai killer. Now they know who he is. Gino and Henry, they're going to go get in touch with Whiteley and they're going to go identify. They're going to go positively, how did I say it like that? Positively ID him. And Henry calls Whiteley on the payphone. Mob bosses, they got another job.
job for him. Whiteley's kind of, he's like, this is weird. I'm on to you, but meet me at this bar. And Henry goes up to Gina. So stay in the car. I'm going to go in there and you can identify him from outside. If he is the killer, I'll kill him. And he's at the bar. Whiteley gets a Mai Tai for him, but Henry's like, no, thank you. I'll have a whiskey. They talk for a little bit, but they end up going to the bathroom. From behind, Whiteley, he stabs him with a needle to the neck and then ends up dragging him out of the bar, telling the bartender, oh, sorry, my buddy can't handle his liquor. Get into a car and they drive off. Well, Gino's watching and he follows in the car too. And then he sees Whiteley taking out Henry into I think it was his apartment building or whatever wherever he carves up people and then Gino goes to a payphone calls Patrick and he's like you need to get here right now and they see Henry laid down on the slab his ear has been cut off and then they see the sentinel lower down the Jesus thing and they're knocked out by Whiteley Patrick wakes up and he is bound and gagged Gino and Henry they're bound but they're not gagged and Whiteley tells Pat that his noble heart is gonna work better for the sentinel we're gonna cut you up and I'm gonna go ahead and take this heart from you you're not using it are you Henry, he ends up breaking his f***ing hand to get out of the handcuffs. The only thing he can find to get out of there is with a hacksaw. He saws his hand off. I'm going to read from the notes because he's talking about the sentinel thing and I don't know what the going on. Parts of gay men were necessary for his sentinel to protect the gay community. And transfused with blood and adrenaline, his creation will rise. All right. Well, then Gino runs in there with a chainsaw. Henry comes in there with a cleaver. Pat, he and I don't know how... I don't really care. But he ends up being able to get up and reach for his gun. Before he shoots, he sees like all the ghosts of the past victims. Points the gun at him. Bam! Shoots him in the head. Whiteley is died. So then at the precinct, Patrick, he's having to fight off reporters now. To his chief's office. Gives him his badge. And he's like, I'm f done. Well, the chief is like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's talk about this. What if I put you on investigating on gay stuff? <laughs> Basically is what he's saying. Patrick is like, well, can we open up past cases? Like the Ascension fire? What the f happen there and the chief doesn't say anything <laughs> eh. and then patrick is like yeah that's what i thought i'm done and he leaves and he quits before he actually leaves he actually takes adam down to the morgue try to positively id his friend sully on the sentinel thing but he doesn't but they said that the sentinel was made up of about seven people hannah is telling adam that most of her symptomatic patients have all disappeared they go and talk to the lezzies about how the labs and the schools nobody's gonna give them any clearance to do this testing on this contagion spreading rapidly fran and her group declined to write about anything in the paper because they don't want to spread any news that is not fact yet well then adam starts figuring out i think this leather face guy he's targeting people with this blood-borne illness and it's separate from the mai tai killer which is exactly what's happening if you didn't pick up already the leather face it's not a real person it's supposed to symbolize HIV and AIDS and so everybody that he's watching after has been affected by AIDS. But Gino says no that they're not gonna publish a story like that but he's like we're not doing that but you and your boyfriend and Hannah should come on vacation with me and Pat. We're gonna go to Fire Island. Patrick is out on the street and he thinks that he sees Barbara from across the street and she's in like this white nightgown. He's freaked out. He goes home. He has a full panic attack. I think we're still being hunted. I don't feel safe at all. And then Hannah's at home. She's packing to go on this trip but she ends of getting sick and they think it's morning sickness or from the pregnancy she calls Adam and she's like hey I'm not gonna be able to come and then she makes a call to her mom and she says no we haven't spoken in a while I'm getting really sick and I was wondering if I could come stay with you for a little bit then we see Leatherface is sitting out there I finished up my whole notebook people I had to start another one on their way over to fire excuse you Theo is getting really sick he's puking over the side of the ferry Adam is like is it seasickness oh I've been sick for a couple of days I've been puking my guts out then Gino and Pat are out on the beach they try and start to get a little intimate Gino freaks out he has like a little bit of PTSD and then he says the sarcoma lesions I keep finding them everywhere find them on you too but then they argue about I don't know what the f are arguing about they always got something to yell at each other about Gino is following a couple into the bushes but does not notice that the leather face is watching his him outside too. Henry is walking with Gino out on the beach, telling him that the mob is still keeping tabs on him. Also, randomly, Henry's like, um, I actually really love you, Gino. He's like, why aren't you in love with me? You don't like me? You don't think I'm pretty? Gay men! We never run scared! Theo 
and Adam are out at a bar, but Theo looks sick as hell. He keeps looking at Sam seated behind Adam at the bar. And Adam just says, well, why don't we go home? Let's smoke a joint. So then Adam goes to pay the bill. Sam is out at the bar talking to Henry because Henry is like, Gina broke my heart. He doesn't love me. And Sam is like, get another guy. There's plenty of fish out here. He says to meet up with him later. And then on the way out, Sam goes to talk to Theo and offers him a truce. Pick that up in just a minute. Fran and her friend, they're talking over dinner about how Fran was invited here because she was offered a big bunch of money to come do a psychic reading for Sam and his house guests. All of a sudden, they start to see Leatherface standing outside the window and they open the door and they try and chase him away. Well, then he reappears at the back of the house and then one of the girls goes out there with a knife and is gonna go stab him. That is bold of you, sister. It's up in his face, all up in his grill like this. And he looks at her and just turns around and walks away. Gino's back at home and he puts on a record. He's walking about the house. Well, then the record stops playing and sees the leather face comes in like a bat out of hell and Adam comes in. They get him kind of corralled into a bedroom and then Patrick is there ready and he goes bah! shoots him in the head. Want to see who it is first before calling the police. They open the door. He's gone. So Fran is at the house party. She's doing a reading for all the guests. The guests are high as hell. They're not gonna remember any of this. Just pulling up these death cards again and again. Well Henry he's outside the party and he sees Sam takes him to this tree where Theo is there strung up. He says it's Theo's fantasy to be dominated and taken advantage of. Well, they both see the leather face and so Henry's like um all right I'm out. Theo he starts to visualize all of these past men that he's taken pictures of and they're all wearing deer antlers. They tell him that he will be remembered and they untie him and he walks away with them into like this white light. Um he dies. At Theo's funeral Adam is asking Patrick if he knows anything about like his death and what went on but he says I don't think it's related to anything that we've been investigating. He also says that he's pretty much excommunicated from the police department anyway. And Sam ends up passing out. Before he's knocked out for good, he sees Leatherface kind of watching. He wakes up in this gross looking hospital and he sees a nurse, Billy. Do you remember Billy? When Sam and Patrick met, had sex with the guy and that he died. You're not a nurse, what are you doing here? Well, Billy's like, well, you never asked what my profession was. This is like him in the limbo state. This whole scene is him like crossing over. Theo walks in and he is Sam's doctor and he tells him that his immune system is too weak to fight off this infection causing pneumonia. And he also tells them, this is the only hospital that'll take you because you scare everybody else. Well, then they start wandering around the hospital, go into this other room, and he's like, what the f is that smell? Theo says, this is Danny. Don't you remember him? He was our first partner in our open relationship. He was admitted to the hospital with the same disease. And then they go and see another room. Stuart is in there and he is also sick as hell. They go room by room and see all of these boys that Sam has taken advantage of. They end up back in Sam's room, but Sam can see his own body and his body is just rotting away. Theo says, all your friends, everybody just dropped you off here because they didn't want to deal with you. Then he convulses in his spirit shown locked in a cage. So he's like descending down. And then we see Henry and they see the leather face and he starts whipping this man. They reveal it to be Sam's father. And he's like, oh my God. And they bring in another guy. Sam says, that's my first boss that I ever had on Wall Street. He was like, I was so smarter than all of them. And I knew when to get out. He kind of over his boss and then dipped. They kind of go one more step down and they're out on the beach on Fire Island. Leatherface is chasing after Sam. Henry's there and he's like, you can't outrun him. And then behind him, we see all of the boys dressed up as deer. And he goes up to Leatherface and he unties the mask. And we see this random dude. Like <laughs> We don't know who he is. They're gone and we see Henry holding up an urn, walking into the ocean and dumping the urn out. So Sam has died. To 1987. Patrick is in the hospital. He's been admitted for I don't even know how long. The hospital staff is not taking care of anybody really. The flowers are dead. No water for him to drink. The place is in shambles. It hasn't been checked on in God knows how long. Now we realize that Patrick has gone blind due to detached retinas. The doctor comes in, tells him the blind Blindness is permanent. Even if we could do surgery, someone in your condition, it would you wouldn't be able to qualify. Pat tells Gino, go ahead and sell my life insurance policy to pay for the funeral so my parents don't get a penny of it. Later on, Patrick is alone and he's trying to get in touch with a nurse, does the call button thing, but he drops it on the floor, searching around. Remember, he's blind, but he can find a wheelchair and he can wheel himself out into the hallway. And then he hears Barbara and she's like, I'm gonna take you around. And she's like the ghost of Christmas past. She's Marley and 
and he's Scrooge. Their first stop is in 1980. And this is where Patrick and Gino first meet, investigating a gay man that has jumped out of a building, high on drugs or something like that. Of course, Gino is all up in his grill trying to get the story. Anyway, that's where they meet. And Barbara is like, this is where our marriage ended. And then we go to 1977. We're gonna jump around pretty quickly. Patrick and his partner at the time, and Patrick's partner ends up shooting a suspect. Barbara was like, you knew he was in the wrong. You still told him it was okay. Patrick and his partner, they're in the shower because he's trying to help him clean up. They kiss. Macaulay Culkin comes in there and he's like, what is going on? Well, Patrick pushes the partner off and he ends up cracking his head on the wall. He says, oh my God, he tried to kiss me. <laughs> now this part confused me because I was like, what is, is this a dream? He shows a vision of Patrick working for Whiteley, cutting up people. And he's like, I can't do this right. You're better at this than I am. And Whiteley's trying to explain how to cut people up. But Barbara tells him that his constant reinvention covered up old wounds. I don't get that part. I don't know what that was all about. <laughs> there was a memory that she showed him. Patrick with his dad, who's a, a sheriff and his grandpa was a sheriff. We're men and we protect. And you can't be gay. You're a limp wrister. You're not a man. Whatever. Learning how to shoot a gun with his dad. His dad was getting frustrated as hell because he couldn't hit the target. That he takes the gun from him puts it right by his ear and shoots it, busts his eardrum. So 1987, we're back over here. Gina was sitting with Patrick and he's holding him. We see Miss Kathy singing. We see Barbara there. We see the leather face there. Patrick dies. Back in 1981, after Theo's funeral, Adam is walking along, he sees a body being wheeled out. Miss Hannah, she's died because she also saw Leatherface. You remember that? After she called her mom? She didn't see him, but he was standing out there. Adam goes in there and he's like, this was the mother of my child. What the f happened. They say, well, she died of natural causes. And he ends up finding her tape recording. She was recording all of her thoughts. And one of the recordings says, surprised to see the deer on the island have repopulated. And there's another tape of her talking about T-cell lymphoma. That tape you can hear, it sounds like she's gasped for air. But then Adam's like, it sounds like she's being strangled. And he asks the examiner to check and make sure that she wasn't. They say, no, she wasn't. But the cases are not related to like the Mai Tai killer. They're still in the Mai Tai killer thing. He learns that Theo died from an untreated fungus infection that caused pneumonia and then another tape of Hannah's she most likely contracted whatever is making her sick got the sperm from Adam she turkey basted that thing and that's when it all clicks for Adam that the leather face is just a representation for the HIV and AIDS virus and Adam goes around hanging up posters promoting safe sex and use protection on the subway home he sees that crazy old lady again and she's laughing at him but she leaves behind a newspaper and it says that there's a new cancer spreading in gay men now we're in 1987 again Gina He's going to the pharmacy to get his medicine for his treatment and he goes to Patrick's funeral. Well, the years go by. We're in 1990 now. Gino has plenty of friends pass away from HIV and AIDS. Scene of like all these men falling into a, a, an open grave. The leather face is constantly lurking around. Gino slowly but surely gets sicker and sicker and in 1990 Gino dies. He died. And then Adam gives the eulogy at his funeral and then it just ends with statistics and stuff like that and they say 150 50,000 people had been reported dead at that point due to HIV and AIDS. And anyway, that is our story. I don't know, this season, like I said, it felt like the most un-American horror story of all of the seasons. It got kind of confusing having the Mai Tai killer and the fact that they were like, this is who it is in the first, what, third episode? Not even the second episode. It's a pretty forgetful season. And it's so unfortunate because this really is an American horror story. The AIDS virus. I also heard some people were, I don't know how to phrase it, but they were not impressed by it. Watered down storytelling of the AIDS virus. It's just Ugh. I, I, truthfully, I'm kind of glad I'm done with this season. <laughs> I think I said it in the last last season I covered. I had never watched this season. I got up to first episode of Death Valley double feature. And when all those kids got pregnant, I said, all right, f this, I'm not watching. <laughs> I wasn't missing much. Now we've got one more season left to go. All right here, bestie, we can do it. I hope you enjoyed this part and I will see you when I see you. Are y'all ready for this? Dun, 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 dun. I bleached my hair for this part of the video. <laughs>
<laughs> Isn't that so funny? Wasn't that a funny joke? It's a wig. You don't want to see what's going on under here. Figure if I went bald for the first half, I could do a wig for the last one. We are here. Final season, well, so far, of American Horror Story season 12. We're here! We're, We're so, so glad, glad you're finally here! here. I didn't think this day would, God, ugh. I mean, let's just get into it. Oh, this is gonna be itchy. Season 12 of American Horror Story, Delicate. I'm gonna give you my ranking, and this may shock some people, given my hatred for a certain person that is a main character in this season. I didn't mind it. This was one I was not looking forward to watching. This one and NYC were the two that I was like, ugh very much Rosemary's Baby. Big trigger warning, infertility, miscarriages, sex. There's blood, as always. There's killing, as always. I feel like you kind of know what you're getting yourself into. If you're already this far into watching this video, yeah, I'm not gonna waste really a lot of time jabbing my jaws. <laughs> the first episode opens up with a little title card. It says, unto the woman he said, I will multiply thy pain and thy conception. In pain thou shalt bring forth children. Genesis 3.16. Ugh, thanks. Meet our main characters, most of our main characters right off the bat. And we all know, I'm not a fan, but she is here. Emma <laughs> Roberts. <laughs> Bikini <laughs> bottom. She is playing Anna Victoria Alcott. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is also taking place in the current year. We've made it to modern times. Is sleeping in her bed one night and she thinks that she feels her husband next to her. She's married to <laughs> this guy named Dex. She thinks that she feels Dex. Turns over, it's someone in a cloak. It kind of just shoots up out of the bed. It looks almost supernatural. And Anna starts running through the house chasing after this thing. Calls the police. Police don't really care that much. Oh, this is also taking place again in New York City. And she sees a bloody trail back into her bedroom. A torn up picture, an embryo. She's been doing some IVF treatment to try and have a baby. We're gonna cut back to that scene. Now we're gonna jump back one week earlier. She's getting out of the shower. She gets a call from Dex and he's like, where are you? What do you mean? Appointment for the IVF treatment, not for another hour. I have it in my calendar, nine o'clock. And he's like, uh, no, we're due at eight o'clock. Anyway, so she's rushing. She runs out of, she's not rushing. <laughs> she is rushing. She runs out of the apartment building. She sees a woman. She's just staring at the ground like this. And it goes up to what she was looking at. It's a bird's nest, broken bird egg. So Anna, Anna? Excuse me, formal. Before she goes in, she sees a billboard of herself. Because Anna is an actress and she just starred in a movie called The o Auteur and she has to stop and take a selfie. Rushes inside and this is where we meet. <gasps> I didn't print off a picture of someone pretty important. Dennis O'Hare, I'm so sorry, but I didn't print off your picture. <laughs> she goes inside and she meets with her doctor, Dr. Hill, played by Dennis O'Hare, that I did not print the picture off. She's talking to some of the nurses too, and they're going up the, the procedure, and she's like, I know, I've been through this like three times already. She wakes up and Dr. Hill is there, and he says, we got nine eggs. He's prescribing her a whole regimen of things to do, and he gives her little pills of hormones, and he says, keep them refrigerated and take one a day. Well, when they're wheeling her out, she's like, I'm in a lot pain actually. I I've never felt pain like this. Are we sure this is right? And they're like, yeah, shut up. You're fine. When she's sitting in the wheelchair. She sees someone. This is Miss Preacher. And yes, she does have her name printed on a bag. Preach. She comes up to Anna. She says like, I know who you are. And Anna's thinking, I am an actress. So thank you for watching. And she's like, no, that's not what I mean. She ends up taking her picture too. And then Anna's thinking woman that she saw looking at the bird's nest earlier. And she tells Dex about it, but he's just kind of like, yeah, okay, whatever. And then we see, this was one reason why I was not looking forward to this season. Kim Kardashian. Kim Kardashian. She's playing Siobhan. She is Anna's agent and they're BFFs too. They met in an in vitro, uh, like a support group thing. They both were trying for kids and they couldn't have them. Siobhan's telling her about certain TV appearances she's gonna have to make. The movie that she's in booming and there's award buzz going around. Wanting to win an Oscar, that's the having a kid, winning an Oscar. <laughs> what she cares about most. You're gonna be on the Andy Cohen show. Watch what happens live. She says it's gonna be on Thursday. Thursday's her appointment to get the embryo transfer thing and she's like uh life starts conflicting with career and Siobhan's like if you're serious about this you need to make sacrifices and Anna's like okay I'll do it I'll be there she also has Anna sign a bunch of stuff for fans and one thing in particular Anna was a child star tv show called summer day a barbie doll basically of her character from that tv show and Siobhan is like I specifically want you to sign her stomach <laughs> 
she initials it and then puts it away. So after they make the plans for the Andy Cohen show, Siobhan is like, why is the doll there? The doll is out of the box still and placed in Anna's bag. And she's like, I didn't put it there. Anna ends up telling Siobhan about the IVF treatments and she's like, are you upset about this? Like, hell f no, congratulations. Anna and Dex are out at the park talking about how she's gonna have to do this interview and it's conflicting with the scheduling. He's like, are you even serious about this? You're starting to see some little rifts happening in the relationship. Anna brings up Dex's past relationship. Dex was married to a woman named Adeline. Why didn't y'all ever have kids? We just decided that it wasn't for us. Well, Adeline, unfortunately, passed away. Freak accident. She owned a restaurant. She died in a kitchen fire there. We'll talk more about that later. Dex is like, uh, Anna, you got something in your hair. A f***ing spider. Ugh. Spiders are like some imagery that was, at least when they were promoting the show, there's a lot of spider imagery. They go back home and Anna's hormones that she's supposed to keep in the fridge are sitting out on the counter. And Dex is like, did you leave them out? They gaslight the hell out of Anna in this season. If you've seen Rosemary's Baby, it's the same premise because they were gaslighting the hell out of Mia Farrow. <laughs> she's on so many different medications. So they're like, oh, well, you must have forgot. You must have done this. If this didn't happen. What you think is happening is not happening. Later on, they go out to dinner with some friends. Well, Dex's friends, Talia or Talia. And she's got a girlfriend or wife or whoever named Theo. She's not in the season very much. Anyway, Talia is kind of a stuck up snooty British bitch. She was best friends with Adeline Dex. He owns a gallery, puts on art shows and stuff like that. Whatever people do at art galleries. <laughs> she says that Dex has sold out his next show. Person he went to meet while, while he was out of town. He met up with someone named Sonia. That's her. It's already sold out, but he never told Anna about this. So she's finding out right now and she's like, well, thanks for telling me. Talia keeps remarking, Sonia looks so much like Adeline. It's so weird. They look exactly like. So then Anna's like, um, cause he's going off out of the country to meet up with this girl that looks exactly like his ex-wife that she feels like he's not necessarily over yet. And it's just like, I need a minute. I'm going to the bathroom and talks on the phone to Siobhan. Siobhan is like, well, what are your fears with this? If you do get pregnant, I'm afraid that my eggs have dried up. I'm like an old spider. A baby's going to crawl out of my dust balls. And Siobhan's like, I'll love your dust ball spider baby anyway. Talia comes into the bathroom and she apologizes. Like, I can really put my foot in my mouth. Oh, she's British. I can really put my foot in my mouth. That was so bad. Mouth, mouth, mouth. How would you say mouth? Mouth. I feel like I'm sounding Irish. I sound very Irish. She says, oh, we might need to switch tables when we go back out there because there's a family with a kid sitting near us. I cannot sit next to him. I hate kids. And so Anna going through her IVF, she's like, to change the subject, she's like, oh, I really like your lipstick. And Talia's like, oh, well, you can have it. And she's like, no, I don't really look good in red. I don't really wear it. Like, Come on, just take it. She takes it just to shut her up. And they're leaving. Anna sees under the stall green studded shoes and she's like, Dr. Hill calls. He's got two embryos that he can transfer. The sooner the better. But you know, she's got that Andy Cohen thing. She's like, can we push it one day or two? I'd be like, can you do it right now? He keeps, <laughs> I think he sounds really funny. He's like, whatever, it's your body. <laughs> Interviews on Thursday. They set the next appointment for Friday. She puts it in her phone at 11. So later that night, Anna looks up Adeline online, read the, the blogs about her, what happened, the tragedy. While she's reading it, she sees comments. People are not fans of Anna. Critically acclaimed for her movies, but she's not liked online by the general population. Like that skank ho can't replace Adeline. I didn't realize Adeline was that famous, but whatever. She's not getting a lot of love for being the next wife. She goes and checks her calendar date for her embryo transfer. Right in front of her eyes, it changes from 11 down to 12. 12 o'clock. Just like she was saying, oh, my appointment's at nine. And he's like, no, it's at eight. Something is f***ed up with your calendar, boo. She calls the clinic to schedule her appointment at 10 o'clock and she writes it out on a sticky note. So her and Siobhan, they go to the Andy Cohen show. She does her interview. It goes good until Anna sees in the audience, Miss Preacher sitting out there. She gets a little quiet and like, even Andy's just like, of course gets attention online for being a f weirdo. Memes start rolling in. She sees another summer day doll, but at this time it has an X on the stomach. She's like, Siobhan, where the hell did this come from? They discontinued it and Siobhan's like, eBay. <laughs> she does some good old fashioned 
hate scrolling, looks for the trolls herself that are talking bad about her. One of the accounts, it says, watch out Anna, or watch your back Anna, or they're watching, something weird and ominous like that. And it's Miss Preacher's account has one picture posted and it's of Anna at the clinic. She is certain that there's someone in her apartment. So she grabs a knife and she looks and her sticky note, her appointment time is torn in half and put back up on the fridge. She calls up Dex, but he's at his art show. And they had agreed that she wasn't gonna go to it because she had her interview and then had to get up in the morning to go to the transfer thing but she said let me get ready and I'll come there she gets there and she sees a woman that was from earlier looking at the bird's nest and she sees her standing amongst the paparazzi paparazzi that was really good paparazzi. when she goes inside she goes straight up to this piece Miss Sonia and she says I made this piece with my own menstrual blood Ew. Ew. If somebody told me that, I'd be like, thank you, I'm gonna leave. She points out Anna's lipstick that she's wearing because she's wearing the red lipstick and she's like, you never wear red. How do you know that, Sonia? Anna sees that she's wearing the green studded heels. Oh, you must have been in the bathroom. She doesn't say it, but she's singing it. Dex comes up behind Anna and scares the shit out of her and she screams. And then he says her emotional energy is distracting and asks her to leave. What the hell is wrong with you? For the embryo transfer, Anna's like, this is a lot more painful than it really should be. And then in the haze of it all, she sees Miss Preacher coming over to her. She bites her tongue and then gives Anna a kiss with a bloody mouth. So when she goes to give her a kiss, Anna's mouth is completely sewn shut. Anna wakes up and she sees Dex sitting next to her, embryos in a frame next to her. It's nice. You see the opening scene. You remember when I told you she thought she saw a blood trail going back to her room to the torn up embryo thing? No, it was the lipstick. So she's got lipstick all over her hand. Lipstick in my Valentine! On her mirror, there's a reminder written on in the lipstick, and it says, Don't do it, Anna. <laughs> Why did I need my notes for that? Then the police review security footage, and they see Dex walking, walking out of the apartment building and then walking back in a little bit later on, and he says he went out to go get some dog food because they forgot to feed their dog. And then police are asking, like I said, they're so nonchalant and they don't believe Anna, but they're, you know, they're going through the routine. Well, why didn't your dog bark at an intruder? And she's like, well... I don't know. So ask about the lipstick on her hands and then ask about her med. And so it's just not looking good for her. She's just looking insane in the membrane. Anna the next morning goes to Siobhan's office. There's a little surprise party happening because she has been nominated for a Gotham Award. They say basically if you get a nomination and you win this, you're a shoe in for all of the awards this season. They take a picture. That's where Kim Kardashian says, Gorgina. She's like, I need you to post this on social media. And I was like, well, I'm really trying to stay off of social media altogether. Mentally, I just can't take it. Siobhan is like, I don't fing care what you want. Are you in this to win this or not? We need to garner votes through social media. She gives her a whole regimen of like what she's gonna do social media wise. I need you to start taking these two and slides a vial across the table. She says it's a B12 shot and then she gives her a whole case of them. And later Anna, she's throwing up. She calls the clinic. A woman answers, the receptionist is Cora. And she asked Anna about her stalker. And Anna's like, I didn't say anything about a stalker. Cora's like, oh, well you, you told me last time you were here you had one. And so Anna's like, oh, I guess I forgot. She she asks about Miss Preacher. Cora says that she's just crazy and drops off pamphlets about how IVF is murder. She's just a crazy old bat. <laughs> Anna asks to talk to Dr. Hill and we can hear Dr. Hill on the other line. I don't want to talk to her. Don't give me that phone. I've been vomiting. I don't know if that's a good sign. If I should go ahead and take a pregnancy test. He's like, no, just hold off. I want you to wait for two weeks before you start taking a test. Well, Anna's cooking one day. Calendar got a date circled for when she could take a pregnancy test. Dex comes up behind her and scares the shit out of her again. And she's got a knife in her hand. She turns around and slices his face. And he's like, what the f wrong with you? And then he says, I think you should take that pregnancy test. You seem a little irritable. Well, no, I can't. I gotta wait two weeks. And he says, it's already been two weeks. And she looks at the calendar. All the dates are scratched off and it's two weeks later. Rose takes the test. Yep, she's pregnant. Good job, you guys. Well, you all didn't do anything. <laughs> and then Sonia ends up calling while they're having this moment together. Dex is like, I'm really sorry about this, but I have to go. I have another art show. You might want to run this by your wife, sir. And they get a scan done. And Dr. Hill shows her the heartbeat and he just tells her to avoid any kind of stress. And then Siobhan brings over a dress, a Gotham Awards, and it's a dress that Madonna wore at the Oscars or something like that. Siobhan is like, why didn't you wipe that message off? You know the one that says, don't do it, Anna? She said, I tried, it won't come off the mirror. Put the dress on, they start singing Madonna in the mirror. Out of nowhere, the 
mirror just it cracks, explodes pretty much. We're going to the Gotham Award. And I love awards these. Oh my God, I love it. While she's walking the red carpet, we see Babette. Anyway, but she's a young actress. She's in the same category nominated for another movie called Daddy, Don't You Love Me or something like that. I don't know. Anyway, she goes up to Anna and she's like, I loved watching you in this movie. Even if you are an old hag, like she's not very subtle about these backhanded compliments and commenting on her age. Just something I noticed. They really tried to make Anna seem like she was a fucking dinosaur. I think she's born in 88. What is that? 35? 34? If you wanted to make it seem, age gap seem that drastic, maybe make her like 45 or something. Then that would be some drama because, you know, a geriatric pregnancy, hello. Make her like Vivian's age from Murder House. <gasps> I could have made this season so much better. The photographers are taking pictures and they say something like, two generations collide. That's some backhanded compliment. So they're sitting at their table waiting for the award. And we see the director of the auteur, I hate this word, auteur. His name is Hamish. At first he was giving me very much Lee Weinstein vibes. Talking to Anna, trying to, uh, I think he thinks he's complimenting her, but it's very much misogynistic. Anna goes to the bathroom. This scene is... She meets a lady who comes up behind her and is like, I am such a big fan. I love you so much. This is her. I don't know what her name is, actually. I don't think they even address her as her name. Anna ends up getting sick. A fan comes in there and you think, oh, she's going to help you know, pull her hair back or something. Like, no. He puts her hand on her belly and is holding her stomach. And Anna's like, what the f*** are you doing? I'm going to play the scene. It's so goofy looking. It is a little graphic, so if you're sensitive to that, you can skip ahead a little bit. Anna pushes her off of her. A fan falls back, hits her head on the counter and then cracks her head open and dies. <laughs> like at first when it happened, I was like, was this a joke? Why did they make it look like that? Anyway, she's sitting there and she's like, holy sh I just f killed this person. Somebody's trying to come into the bathroom and she's like, go away, please. Her category is being called. So she ends up leaving the bathroom. She wins her award. While she's up there accepting her award, we hear just a slow, slow clap and she's looking around the auditorium the fan is sitting at a table in the back slow clapping and then we see Dex start making out with a woman next to him preacher has a bloody mouth just all these weird visions are coming to her and Anna starts throwing up throwing up blood in front of everybody this is really happening this isn't a vision and then somebody's trying to go into the bathroom and she says don't go in there and the lady turns around like and the medics are talking to her and she says, did you find her in the bathroom? And she hit her head and died in the bathroom. And they're like, no, there's no one in there. Online, of course she's getting a whole litany of media attention for throwing up at the podium. Nobody knows she's pregnant. Like she hasn't announced it to the public yet. So they're just thinking it's just a weird, you threw up? I threw up. Dex and Anna, they're like, we need to just get away for a little bit. Talia, 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 house in the Hamptons. She gives it to them to use for the week. Talia's introducing Dex and Anna to her security. His name is Kamal. Talia has got security cameras all over the house except for in the basement. Anna is very kind of suspicious about Talia wanting to help. Her personality, she's very self-centered, so she's like, why is she doing this for us? And her suspicions only intensify because when she goes to get a fork from the drawer, she sees a picture, and it's a picture of Dex, Talia, Theo, and Adeline. It was an old picture that they took together. But anyway, I mean, it's not weird because that was her best friend. Weird place to keep a picture in your knife drawer in the cutlery. She goes towards the basement. She starts hearing some chanting and Kamal sees her. No security cameras down in there. And Kamal's like, well, I'll go check it out. Go down there. Nothing's down there. Of course not. Why would there be? Anna does some pregnant yoga and she feels some cramping, a lot of pain. And so Kamal takes her to the hospital. Because as soon as they get in the car, she looks down and blood is gushing out of her hoo-ha. She's there by herself. Dex is not there yet. A nurse comes in and she says that her name is Ivy. Yes, it's Cara Delevingne. Watching Cara Delevingne act is very hard <laughs> on the viewer. It's so bad. You realize that she's the one that was staring at the bird's nest and also the one that was standing with the paparazzi and the one that's been following Anna around. She comes in and she says, I'm going to give an ultrasound now to make sure that your baby's okay. She does the ultrasound and she gets a... This is also a red flag. To me, ultrasounds rub it over top of the skin. The jelly on, rub the top. Well, she pulls out a wand. Some may use it as a dildo, maybe. Shoves it up her hoo-ha. I'm sorry, I don't think that's how you take an ultrasound. Maybe there's new technology 
technology. I don't know anything about the medical world. So. And she's really working it. Like you can see her arms are moving and grooving in there. She pulls out the thing. It is covered in blood. Ivy says, I'm gonna go get the doctor. And then we see Anna walking to the bathroom, leaving a trail of blood behind. She sits on the toilet and she has a miscarriage. Dex shows up a little while later and he says that his phone was off convenient. The doctor that's there that she's gonna need an ultrasound to check everything out. She says, well, I already had an ultrasound. Your nurse Ivy came in and did it. And he's like, we don't have anybody here by that name. So Dex tells Anna that he told the police about this supposed nurse, but Anna's like, well, they're not gonna believe you. They don't believe me about hardly anything. Everybody thinks I'm crazy. As they're on the way home from the hospital, he's already asking, well, should we try it again? As in like, try getting pregnant again? Give her a second. She says, I think whoever's stalking me is not wanting me to have this baby. She thinks a lot of people are out to get her. She thinks Ivy, obviously she thinks Miss Preacher could be the stalker. I don't know. People are acting weird. Who is this lady? What the hell? She's disappeared after she cracked her head open. He says that they should keep trying. He's dismissive about her reasons and opinions and she's like just stop the car. I'm gonna walk. She just starts walking through the woods. He's Miss Preacher out in the woods at a campfire singing Rockabye Baby. It looks more like a ritual sort of. She goes back home and Dex is there and he's freaking out. He's on the phone. He's like oh my god where have you been? A little bit later in the night so he's like I thought you got lost. She tells them about what she saw out in the woods. So then when they go out to the woods, nothing's there. She looks crazy yet again. This morning we meet Talia's house manager, Nicolette. We hear her singing down in the kitchen. Anna goes down there to see, first of all, who the hell is it? It's a video of her singing to her baby. She just had a baby like six weeks ago. You see, a gift basket has arrived for Anna from Hamish, the director. Anna brings the basket to Dex. Why did you tell him where we were staying at? This is supposed to be a private place away from everything. I'm not supposed to know. And he's like, I didn't say anything. I haven't pointed it out yet, truthfully, because I forgot it actually. I guess starting in like episode two, we start to see a little spot on Anna's chin. It gets gross. I'm not into like the skin picking and stuff. It's a mark that just will not go away. But Dex sees it and he's like, are you having an allergic reaction to something? And she's like, just don't, don't touch it, please. Starts thinking about Ivy. And Ivy also had the same mark in the same spot. Well, then Dex tells her that Siobhan should come by for a visit for a girl's night in. Well, hours later, we see Anna and she's eaten everything that is in that gift basket. Like she's having some weird cravings. And then Siobhan comes in. She's like, girl, get up. I'm making you a salad. Siobhan talks about other miscarriages that she's had. Anna is like, is it normal to still feel like I'm pregnant? Cause I feel like I am. And she says, yeah, that's probably normal. <laughs> Who are you to say? They're out on a walk on the beach and Kamal is following. Anna's talking about how she doesn't think Dex believes in her about anything. Also thinks that Dex is having an affair with Sonia. No, I don't think he is. You're fine. Soon we're gonna start this Oscar run. So get in gear, girlfriend. Siobhan leaves and then Anna looks ahead on the beach and she sees another summer day doll. This time it's got little nails poked into its stomach. Tells Kamal like, okay, we're done here. Let's go home. And then we see two figures women standing at the other end of the beach dressed like this and they're holding on to two goats. These are the delicates and they're just sitting back watching her. So Anna takes the doll and the bottle of wine that came from the gift basket. She goes down to the basement. She looks at Talia's baby stuff that's down there. There's a crib down there. It starts playing music. It plays Rockabye Baby. That's gonna be a, a common song. And then Anna starts drinking the wine and she passes out when she wakes up. And she looks over and she sees a small door and she hears that chanting again. So then she goes, crawls through the door. <laughs> Who does she think she is? Alice? The walls have blood smudged up on them. She gets into the main rooms of these tunnels. Fetal body parts and jars. And then another room has a birthing table on it. Stirrups like a gynecologist. I said, that's what it would be, not a birthing table. She tries to leave, but the women in black, the delicates, put a rag over her face and inject her with something and she passes out. She wakes up in the basement. Anna calls Dr. Hill and she's asking, is it possible? Could have been wrong. This wasn't a miscarriage at all. And she actually still is pregnant. And he was like, no, from the blood loss you have, the damage that was done, I highly, highly doubt it. And he says that the scary dreams, you know, of the, the delicates could be from trauma, from having the miscarriage. And Nicolette comes up to her and she tells her you're bleeding from the mouth and so Anna goes and she googles bloody gums as a symptom of being pregnant and they're like yep so she's like 
She goes to the store looking at all the baby stuff. She finds a onesie and she starts smelling it. And then we see some of the delicates walking around. Store person, employee maybe. Hey, we're about to close. Is there anything you want to get? So she was looking for a heart monitor so she could see if she has a heartbeat. The employee's like, um, I think we're out, but hang on. Let me try something. Puts her hand over her belly and she's like, yep, you're pregnant. She says she feels the baby kicking. She finds the onesie and she's on the way home. Ask Kamal that's driving her to pull the car over. She sees Sonia. Well then, where are you? God. Dex comes up to Sonya. Sonya's been locking eyes with her too. She wasn't subtle about like, oh, I didn't see you over there. She was full on locking eyes with Anna. Dex comes over across the street. Anna's like, oh, I don't want him to see me here. She goes to get back in the car. Well, Miss Preacher out of nowhere says, watch out for her. Kamal gets out with his gun and chases her away. And Anna's like, I told you, nobody believed me. That is the woman that's been following me. She resets her calendar password and then she makes an appointment. In the appointment title, she says, what do you want? And almost immediately another appointment pops up and it says, I want to warn you. This is so spooky. This is so like Nancy Drew coded. It also says they did something to your baby and she asked if they killed her baby. Message pops up and says baby isn't dead. So she goes outside and she sees a dead rotting raccoon carcass and she's looking at it being eaten by maggots and then behind her we see Nicolette is watching from inside the house looking creepy as hell. He's just standing there staring at her. Pause. I need a Diet Coke. <laughs> oh god. Okay we're gonna get our Another year up here, thank God. It's very lopsided right now. 1555, Hampton Court, England, and Queen Mary I, Bloody Mary, is delivering her own baby. I don't know if this actually happened like this. Ordered all the servants and everybody to stay out. Well, her sister, Elizabeth, you know, they only have like four names back then. She sees Mary holding the baby, the heir to the throne, but she sees that the baby is a fucking monster. Two women, two delicate, people come in and take the baby. He's waited 6,000 years to be born. Queen Mary promised the baby to them for a fruitful kingdom. Elizabeth is just like, well, they tell her, you'll give us your baby when the time comes for you to have kids. And she's like, I will not. And then they say, okay, well, you're barren now. Wave their hand over her belly. Looks painful as hell. Now she can't have kids. See, the newborn is born with like talons. You see like a, a claw coming out and it's taken away. Anna's looking at this rotting raccoon carcass. Remember she found that? Dex calls for her. Tells Dex about Miss Preacher. She's probably the one that's f***ing up my calendar. He says, Cora, the receptionist, she warned you about her. Anna's like, how did you know about that? How would you know that she told me about her? He says, he told us that at the last meeting we had. No, she didn't. Are you, are you getting it now? <laughs> and Anna, she just, she's having a moment. She scoops up this dead raccoon, brings it into the house. Nicolette's looking at her like, what the f*** are you doing? And she's like, I'm going to nurse it back to health. I can still save it. Anna tells Nicolette, why don't you go home and worry about your own baby? So then Anna puts the baby in the, cr the baby, sorry, the raccoon in the crib. A black cat down there. It's getting very witchy. Anna goes to Siobhan's office in the city and we meet Ashley and Ashley. One is Ashley with an L-E-Y and the other one is spelled L-E-I-G-H. But whatever, they're here. They're trying to polish off her image a little bit and clean up the, the media mess that's been going on. They're to plan her image rehabilitation in prep for the Golden Globe. She won the uh, Gotham Award. She's gotten nominated for a Golden Globe. And anyway, they're gonna twist the narrative of her puking at the awards show, turn it into a feminist video, and they're gonna gaslight the haters. And she's saying like, I don't really wanna go on social media anymore. And they're like, there's no other way out of this. You're gonna do this. If you're on this gravy train with us, buck up, bitch. Anna and Dex go back to their own apartment in the city. They've got a new security system put in. And then we see Dex's mother, Virginia, that's where I live, come from money. Her, Dex, his dad, they've got that snooty attitude about them. And then she starts to say, I need you to test against your father for me. Sorry. His mom and his dad are divorced. Her relationship with his father was not that great. I'll talk more about it in just a little bit. Anna is losing hair and starts pulling out hair. I'm sure I can pull out some hair from this wig. Anna and Dex go to an appointment with Dr. Hill and he's doing another heartbeat scan. They hear a heartbeat. He's like, oh shit. Uh, yeah, there's still a baby in there. He says, well, there is something called vanishing twin. Usually you don't find out you're having multiples until later on. It's difficult to see if there's multiples in there where the more dominant embryo in full face and showing itself more. And then if that one dies, second embryo, the t other twin is in there and it's like, hey, in the parking garage, Anna sees Ivy and she tells Dex and Kamal about her. But then of course, when they go and look, she's not there. Now we see that Siobhan and Hamish are having a sexual 
relationship. They've been having an affair for a while. Hamish is starting to get seriously attached to her, but she's like, I'm here just for the sex. Siobhan was the one that gave the script to Hamish of the auteur. Basically, she just dropped off the script and was like, make this movie and cast Anna in it. You're good. You're gonna win everything. It was like, no questions asked from him until now. And then she says, no one can know that Anna's character in the movie is based off of me. Throughout the show, people have been going up to her and complimenting her on the movie and saying how it was so unnerving and some people couldn't finish watching it. It was a hard watch for some people. I don't know if the season itself is supposed to mimic the auteur about like what's happening in the movie. I probably should have looked it up, but I don't really care that much. <laughs> Anna posts her feminist, it's a video about explaining why she threw up at the award ceremony. And she's like, I'm f***ing pregnant. You make fun of a pregnant woman. We are women. This is my body. This is my choice. She posts it. It goes viral. Virginia talking to Dex at a lunch and she says, why the f*** is Anna pregnant? What the hell is she doing that for? Dex says that Anna wanted to have a maternal bond because she didn't have one. Her mom died very early in her life. And this is where we find out more about what's happening with Virginia and her ex-husband has been working with a therapist specializes in recovery from satanic abuse. I didn't know that was such a thing. Maybe religion trauma, but I didn't know it was that specific. He thinks it's a bunch of fooey. He's like, okay, go off bestie, whatever. And she tells him despite what he remembers, his dad drugged her, made her do ritualistic and hideous activities. And he's just like, if that's what you think, if that's how you feel. So then they're going back to the Hampton. Nicolette congratulates her on her pregnancy, gotten flowers sent to her and she reads the card. On the card, it says, you can't trust any of them. And she goes to the kitchen. This is where she gets all her cravings. She gets ice cream and pickles, starts pigging out. Then she hears the chants again. Wakes up in the basement with the raccoon still in the crib. And while she gets the notification that she has been nominated for a Golden Globe, and at the same time, she picks up this raccoon rotting. Remember that? It's dead and rotting. And she starts eating it, maggots and all. Okay, we are in 1987. And this is where we see what the f happened with Miss Preacher. She's given birth and Dr. Hill is her doctor that's helping her do this. And we see a bunch of nurses dressed up very weirdly. He starts gaslighting her because he's like, because it's very painful and he's not giving her any kind of medication or soothing her in any way. Well, you wanted this baby. It's your choice. <laughs> And reminding her of the deal she made and the delicate women show up and then the baby is born but we don't see it. Dex's mom Virginia is still at this point asking for him to testify but Dex says like I don't have anything against my dad. I don't know what you want me to say. He tells her that she's just gonna look crazy if she goes through with this and she says it's so funny how all the women in the world will help stand up usually to help another woman in need but a man won't even stand up for the woman that birthed him. So then Anna goes to Siobhan's office and then she passes by Babette. Remember the young actress? She's like, hey girl, we're working together like in the same agency. Isn't that so fun? I'm still younger than you. <laughs> then Anna runs into Siobhan's office and she's like, are you representing her? What the fuck? She's in my category. And Siobhan's like, Okay, more business for me. She asks her, she's representing Babette because she's mad at her for getting pregnant. She feels like she's not putting in effort and blah, blah, blah. And Siobhan says no, and it gives her more of those B12 shots. Anna leaves and sees Miss Preacher outside. She almost gets hit by a fucking truck. It'll be a callback later on. Kamal ends up asking Anna if she can sign a magazine for his wife. And uh, she says, okay, well, let me go look for a pen. She goes into the kitchen, to the fridge. <laughs> I don't know why you look in the fridge. And sees it lined up with ice cream. And then she goes to look at the picture in the drawer. You know, all the friends. She sees Ivy in the back of the picture. Then Virginia, we see her coming out of a meeting somewhere. She's confronted by the delicates. And then Miss Preacher comes up to her and is like, I need to speak with you. So then she goes to explain. She was an up and coming star in the fashion world. She got picked up by a bunch of like Givenchy, whoever, I don't know. And she had a one night stand at fashion week, got pregnant. She was going to have an abortion. Some woman came up to her and said, I can help you. This seems so stupid to me because she was like oh okay all she had to do was just give her the baby she doesn't know what the woman wanted but she thinks that she was planning something well yeah no kidding if someone came up to you and said i can give you the world just give me your baby some random woman on the street no thank you and she tells virginia that her and anna are not safe one of these women the delicates deterred from the group and she fell in love 
with Dex. This is uh, Adeline we're talking about. She was one of the women and got involved with Dex and then left the group. More on that later. Anna is having a checkup and she says that she's having a slight pain. Dr. Hill tells her that it's normal and no travel. You need to stay put, bestie. She's at a physical therapy center trying to alleviate some stress. She's in the shower and she, 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 she sees that she's losing more hair and then she turns around and sees a fucking goat in the shower with her. She leaves but before she leaves she sees another doll with a bloody scalp. Then Sonia, they invited Sonia over for dinner. When she comes over there, Nicolette keeps just staring her down and Anna's like, why? What is wrong? And she's like, oh, sorry, I'll leave. Sonia tells Anna that Dex let her know about her stalker. Anna says, I saw you wearing your green shoes. Sonia's like, oh no, I would never wear green. That is not my color. I don't wear green at all. Siobhan and Hamish are having dinner and she just stays on her phone the whole time. Cause she's like, look, I agreed to come over here to have dinner with you. I did not agree to conversation. <laughs> he asks how the script came to be and she knew it would be a success. And is just asking like, who are you really? We don't really get an answer. Dr. Hill has recommended that Anna come in for a pelvic floor massage. So anyway, she goes for that and it's Cora that's doing the massage. Well, go ahead and strip down naked if you want. Anna is very apprehensive about it, but she does anyway. She takes her fingers and goes in inside of her. It just makes Anna very uncomfortable. She is getting so weird about it. Her facial features are just making it really awkward. Again, like Ivy digging around in there. Anyway, Anna's like, get the f off of me. Get your fingers out of me. Gets home. She tells Dex, Cora just fucking molested me. And Dex thinks it's funny because he's like, oh uh, yeah, I'm sure she did. And then she calls him out about him not believing her. And he's like, yeah, I really don't. You're seeing things because you're on these meds. She gets angry with him and she goes down to the basement. Hang on a second. Oh yeah, that's what I needed. <laughs> she turns on the golden globes on her phone and is watching and she ends up losing to Babette. Um, she starts coughing too. She's coughing up it looks like tacks are coming out of her mouth like nails and then Siobhan calls her they talk about the loss she's asking her if she wants this Oscar as bad as she wants a baby and she's like yeah of course I do it's willing to do anything to get it she says yes see her wake up and Dex is sitting next to her and she's like what's going on he hands her a phone Babette is dead she is decapitated in a fatal car accident. I didn't write the date up here. I ran out of this color of post-it notes. The year is 1988 in White Plains, New York. Anna, as a baby, her mom is singing Rockabye Baby to her. She looks very exhausted. Her dad is like, that's a really up song if you think about it. Her mom was like, well, I think it's nice and she likes when I sing to her. After she gets Anna to go to sleep, he's like, when is the last time you showered, you stinky pig? <laughs> she crawls into the bed. She says, I think I'm gonna go to see the doctor tomorrow. I have this pain in my leg. Telling her, oh no, you're fine. Well, in the middle of the night, she is heard coughing and hacking. He's leaned over like this and he's like, can you shut up? <laughs> He rolls over and she is out for the count. They rush her to the hospital and she dies a pulmonary embolism. And her dad is worried about, I don't know anything about taking care of a kid. Anna will not stop crying. A nurse comes in and it says, do you need some help? I can hold her for you. And she starts singing Rockabye Baby. And she turns around, it's Nicolette. In 1988, she looks exactly the same. Oh my God. Well, Siobhan is talking to Anna about what happened to Babette. And they say that Babette was given a blowjob to her driver. A car went off the road and she got decapitated. But we're going to use this now, like a campaign almost <laughs> for the Oscars. Siobhan tells her that she's going to go give a speech at Babette's funeral in LA, even though Dr. Hill told her not to travel. They say that Anna has also been nominated for a SAG award, a Screen Actors Guild award. She is scooping up these awards, but at the funeral, she dedicates her SAG nomination to Babette. We're gonna do it for you, bestie. So they're back home in the Hamptons. Anna finds that black cat and she keeps following it to the edge of the property. And that's where she finds another summer day doll. She's collected all these dolls and is keeping them in the crib. This is where also, okay, so that happened. <laughs> so now we see Dex talking to his father, who's also named Dexter, but we're just gonna call him Dex's dad. He is a and turd. And he's talking about the whole thing that his mom is wanting to testify against him. And he's like, she's a fucking nut. <laughs> His mother is delusional and trying to persuade him to testify against her. Nicolette goes up to Anna and shows her another summer day doll that was naked put on her doorstep like an hour away at her house. Anna marks on a map exactly where all the dolls were found at. She's able to draw 
a pentagram. Nicolette tells her, I heated the pool outside for you. I know when I was pregnant, it just felt so nice to go and float, like sensory deprivation. When Anna's floating in the pool, she sees Nicolette kind of hanging a little too closely. Something is like clawing out of her belly. You see claws actually coming out of the skin. She goes to Dex, tells him that she apologizes for being a mess, a total spaz. He also apologizes for the way that he's been acting. And he leaves, she looks at her stomach and she sees that it's not a vision that she was having. It was real because she's got little claw marks going down her stomach. We cut to a scene with Hamish and Siobhan and he is symbolically burning the script of the auteur. And she's like, okay, what is that supposed to be? He says that he doesn't want to take credit for something that he didn't write and says that he's going to do the right thing and basically out the whole situation. I didn't write this. Siobhan dropped it off and told me to what to do. She says, there's no right thing to do. What are you talking about? Oh my God, you're getting her mad. We're having another gallery opening, okay? For more of Sonia's art pieces. Anna is asking Talia about what's going on in the basement, why the basement doesn't have security cameras. And also says, you know what? I get the feeling that you don't really like me. But Talia is like, I told Dex I'd give you a chance. Anna doesn't believe her. I just think you're lying to me about basically everything that comes out of your mouth. Um, Anna goes to the bathroom and there's blood on her hands that she can't wash off or either blood or lipstick. I honestly can't remember. We also see this fan come back around. Basically another instance like at the award show, she hits her head on the counter again, cracks it open and she looks like she's dead. She sits up and she's like, I ain't dead. Anna is able to get out and then she sees Ivy. Ivy tells her that she's an intern at the gallery. Dex makes a speech, dedicates a speech to Talia for basically buying the gallery. Sonia for creating the art, his mom and also Anna. All of the women in black surround Anna. Talia, the fan, Ivy, Sonia and Nicolette and they're all wearing the green shoes. And Siobhan shows up and she kind of breaks up this little vision that she's having. And they're eating dinner. Anna's like, I think that those women are doing something to my baby. She's eating some chicken. Vaughn sees her eat the f***ing chicken bone. And she's like, bitch, you're eating bones. They see on the TV that Hamish is dead. <laughs> Siobhan is like, aw, that sucks. Anyway, <laughs> she tells Siobhan, she's like, I think I just need to retire from acting. This is too much pressure. And Siobhan... <laughs> slaps her across the face and she's like, pull yourself together. She says she won't let her hurt her career in exchange for motherhood. And Anna finds a note that says that she can't trust anyone and a phone number is with it. She ends up calling it and guess who picks up? Miss Preacher. She says that the gallery is not safe for her. Then Dex going to look for his mom and he finds his mom in the bathtub dead, bloodied up. And there's a note on the mirror written in lipstick saying, I tried to warn you. All right, we are going all the way back. This is the earliest date we have in American Horror Story history. 42 AD, Miss Ivy giving a very painful birth to twins. Okay. She ends up having to cut the babies out of her stomach. And then we find out it's Sonia. And Adeline, the Ivy kind of, she passes away. A figure dressed in black, one of the delicates comes and brings her back to life. Oh shoot, I wrote the wrong date. Frick. This is gonna look so janky, but I don't have any more of these post-it notes. I thought it happened in 2016, but it actually happened in 2013. Dex, Adeline, this is her. They're having their first anniversary. He gets her a puppy and she's like, what the f why did you get me a dog? Because we could use this as preparation for like when we have kids or something. And she's like, what makes you think I want to have kids? I don't know. Maybe this is something y'all should have discussed before you got married. She goes to her vegan restaurant. It's called Ave Hestia. There's a chant prayer thing that they keep ch chanting. What, uh, what's her face is hearing in the basement. Phrases in the chant is Ave Hestia. She says that she likes to close up by herself. It's her alone time. But what she's really doing is going down to the basement, having a ritual and saying Ave Hestia, whatever the f She's saying. I think it's to like ward off evil stuff. She's trying to leave. Sonia, she comes in. She says, you need to come back and be with us. I don't want to be a part of that anymore. I'm living my life. I'm happy here. But they start playing that knife game, you know, where you put your hand down and you stab him between your fingers. Um, Adeline tells her that she will never return, even though they are requesting that she comes back. She says she has knowledge that, her, that prevents her from returning. Sonia says, well, you can't get out of it because you were born into this. Back here. These women are so old. <laughs> now this is an age gap. And now we're gonna have another time. 1243. Jesus. I don't know why, but to me, like anything before maybe the 1400s, I'm like, those years don't exist. <laughs> Adeline is questioning Ivy. Lies that she's told for her. And, uh, she's just questioning their lifestyle. She's stealing babies and whatnot. Basically wreaking havoc. Ivy just gets ticked off at her and uses some kind of unseen powers and knocks her off her feet and gets up and spits in her face. And when she does that, she leaves a little mark on her chin. That's why we see the mark everywhere on all these girlies. It's signifying an unbreakable connection between them.
Okay, we'll get a tattoo. <laughs> okay, now we're gonna come back over here in 2013. Dex talks to Talia about Adeline's behavior, and then he also is talking to his dad. And his dad ends up getting frustrated with him because he's basically bought him everything. I don't know, he just gets really pissed off at him. He hangs up and he's talking to his wife at the time, Virginia. We're f***ing cutting this boy off. We've bought him everything. He can go off on his own. We can't just leave him, he's our son. And he starts getting very rude. <laughs> don't f talk to me like that i am a man adeline and talia are out shopping they're shopping for jewelry what would you suggest for a person who just recently became a billionaire adeline's like what the f are you talking about yeah i just sold my business for 1.1 billion dollars i don't know what the hell she does i think she bought stock or so i don't know and she says i'm gonna help dex his gallery i'll pay for it and get him started and you guys will be financially covered nicolette visits adeline and she brings her a little vial of teeth she says these are your baby's teeth don't you remember she's had a baby yeah but then she's trying to also get her to come back to the group too adeline goes and buys a pregnancy test at the drugstore and when she's checking out she sees the fan i still don't know what her name is she starts giving her a weird ass smile and, and the pregnancy test is positive but she doesn't tell dex right away so then dex adeline talia and her girlfriend theo they have a dinner they take those pictures adeline can see ivy in the background as well she tells dex to go home she's like i'm gonna close up the restaurant you go home and i'll meet you there he finds the pregnancy test in the garbage can and he's trying to call her but she's not picking up then he tries to call his parents but the line is off the hook so he goes over to his parents house and he sees his dad having sex with someone else a woman in black and that his mom looks drugged up out of her mind and then the dad this is weird he's like this is how you were made and so he ends up getting drugged the dad says we should just wipe his memory well, at the restaurant all the girly pops they get adeline and they pin her down they also reveal that talia is one of the girls too her best friend she's like what the f and they say we're gonna give dex a new wife and she's gonna produce the purest baby yet <laughs> and ivy cuts open adeline they start smearing her blood all over them and dancing and stuff like that stage a, a murder they turn the gas stoves on look like she got burnt up in a gas fire this is where we get that call back i was talking about earlier so 1967 me oh this is gonna look weird 1967 mr frank sinatra no you know what my favorite frank sinatra song is i've got the world on a string i'm sitting on a rainbow I can, ooh, let me do it. <laughs> See him having dinner with his wife, Mia Farrow, the one that plays in Rosemary's Baby. She is Rosemary. And at the time she's filming the movie and he's upset that she's putting more time and focus into her career instead of him. He says, if you go back to work, our relationship is over. So she d ends up going back to, to the set. Cause she's like, no, I want to be in this movie. When she's on the set, director Roman Polanski, who we have talked about in another season in Cult, he is asking her to film a a scene where she's gonna walk into the middle of traffic and she's like oh okay it's all planned and they know not to hit me right it's not real and he's like no i need you to walk into traffic like just do it we're gonna film it it's almost like when anna miss preacher outside of her appointment and she almost got hit by a truck i didn't have enough room to write rosemary's so it's just rosemary baby she does the scenes point in the movie she's supposed to be very pregnant so she's wearing one of those fake pregnancy bellies and she goes into her dressing room she looks down and it looks like she's bleeding and she's having a lot of pain almost like she really is pregnant and then she sees the fake pregnancy belly under her clothes something is clawing out at it and then we hear a voice siobhan's voice and she says just take it off she does that and she looks and the blood is all gone she sees siobhan and and she's like, hey, we're gonna be best friends now. <laughs> Paint the picture that Siobhan's been around for a, a good long while. We're back over here. Dex is giving a speech at his mom's funeral and Miss Preacher comes in and she starts saying like, I told you guys, I told you so. And Anna, you better watch out. She asks the uh, men that escorted Miss Preacher out. She says, where did you guys take her? Well, we took her to the ER. She goes to the ER, but she ends up telling Anna to leave and that they will take everything away. Both of them fall asleep. And when she wakes up, Miss Preacher's gone. She's asking the nurses what happened. And oh, some friends came and got her. Well, then on the TV behind them, they see that Anna is nominated for an Oscar. So Ada and Siobhan are picking out their outfits for the Oscars and they hear a phone buzzing in the bathroom. Find a flip phone in Dex's drawer. Well, it's a booty call. This is ooh, ooh, ooh. They go out to LA for this whole Oscar run. And while they're out there, Siobhan says, you gotta do this, I don't know what they call it, like a swag bag thing where you go and you just hold up a product, take your picture with it and endorse it. She's doing that, but while she's there, she sees Cora there. She's like, what the f 
are you doing here? After some back and forth, Anna realizes, you remember at the very beginning of this season, the opening scene where someone was in bed with her? It was Cora. And Cora is having an affair with Dex. And she was the one that was breaking into her apartment and moving things around, tearing up the post-it notes. And she also took out her hormone pills and put them on the counter, packed into her calendar and was moving the appointments around and making her life hell. Dex got her an apartment in the same apartment building. So that was why they didn't see her leaving. She became obsessed with watching Anna on security cameras and stuff like that. Fucking weird. But then she also goes to talk about, I need to warn you about Dr. Hill because he does some fucked up I'm telling you. He works with women who engage in dreadful acts towards his patients. The delicates, basically. He's as successful as he is, it's because he made a deal with someone. Anna goes back home, tells Dex, get the f*** out. The morning of the Oscars, she looks at her legs. It's like dark scales on her legs. She's running to the bathroom. Siobhan comes in. She's like, um, I gotta go to the bathroom. She's trying to like peel these scales off of her legs. They're not going anywhere. She's cutting her legs up trying to do it. This is also where Kim Kardashian says, are you taking a sh in there? <laughs> She goes up to Siobhan and she opens up her robe. Her legs are fine, except she's got cuts all over the place from where she was trying to pull scales off of her. Anna's out on the red carpet for the Oscars. She thinks that she sees Babette out there with a severed neck and sit down in the auditorium. And as the show starts, Anna is like, oh shit, I'm having contractions. Siobhan is like, you better fucking pinch it off. Sit here through this show, God damn it. You told me you would do anything for this Oscar. Is that still true? And she looks at her and she says, mm-hmm. Anna ends up winning the Oscar. She goes up there and when she's giving her acceptance speech, we hear another low clap. But this time she looks up and she sees her mother audience and she's clapping for her. And on the stage, her water breaks. They take her off stage. There's a scene showing 1970. This is where Siobhan meets Dr. Hill for the first time. She basically comes in there and is like, I'm going to tell you how we're going to do this. She tells him that she will be referring all of her friends to see him and that she will give him the life of his dreams. going to follow my rules. So this is where you find out Siobhan is behind everything in this whole scheme. Anna is backstage and she's asking Siobhan how she knew she would win before she could answer. Dex shows up and so Anna's like, oh, off. Tells him, all right, you can come into the ambulance. So it's Kamal, Anna, Dex. The driver of the ambulance is Ivy. Anna's in the back screaming her head off. She's holding on to her Oscar. Kamal is like, um, do you know where you're going? She gets pissed off and is like, oh, shut the f up. Bop! Kills Kamal. Dex is even like, what the f are you doing? Dex is having to help Anna start deliver this baby. Putting his hand up in, in the cooch. We see him go like, ah, whatever is coming out of her womb bit his hand off. Ivy stops the ambulance, comes around to the back of the ambulance and sees Dex there. She takes his hand that's been bitten off and shoves it down his throat and kills him, chokes him to death. And she's like, thank God, I never thought he would shut up. We'll give him this. This edit was actually really good. See the ambulance and it like the lights flicker. And then we see Anna in a stretcher, like in the middle of the room. It's It was a cool edit. The delicates all come around around and they're starting to help her deliver. She gives birth to a boy. She asks to hold him, but Ivy tells her, no, you're holding your boy, the Oscar. She ends up waking up surrounded by all the women, all the delicates, Talia, this crazy fan, the Ashleys, Ivy, Nicolette, Sonia. They tell her that they seek out women who possess perfection and ambition. She realizes that she's paralyzed. Then we see Siobhan. She's running this whole operation. She's running this here outfit. She tells Anna that to blame for her current condition of being paralyzed because she tried to, when they told her that she couldn't hold the baby, she tried to go after it. Paralyzed her. Tell her that she can join them or end up like Miss Preacher. This is where it gets really kind of info dumpy. Siobhan goes to explain Dex is actually her son. Because she met his father. She had a sexual relationship with De older Dexter. Anna finds out that she gave, gave birth to the most powerful vessel of them all. It's not her baby anymore, it's Siobhan's baby. He says that she can hold the baby, but if she does, then that's basically agreeing to join them. Siobhan ends up killing Ivy because Ivy killed Dex. Dex is Siobhan's son. And then she says, I killed my own daughter for you. Remember she killed Adeline? And she's basically like, not my problem. You chose to do it. Siobhan says, I saved the most important parts from Dex. 
his balls so they can he keep having babies save humanity by establishing matriarchy. Anna notices that the baby is starting to claw at her when she's trying to breastfeed him, hurting her. Siobhan is like, yeah, well, motherhood is a painful experience. And then we also see Miss Preacher severed head. Yeah, Miss Preacher's dead. It almost reminds me of how abruptly double feature Red Tide ended. Miss Preacher was at the hospital and Anna woke up and she was like, where did she go? They all went and got her. But uh, that's what I mean. It's just kind of like, oh, she's dead. All right. Adeline ends up showing herself to Anna. Adeline starts that chant that she used to do, either the Ave Hest Hestio. Anna joins in. When they start chanting, then Siobhan is standing there and Siobhan just shrivels up into a mummy and dies. So this is where I got confused because it's more like you need more numbers to do this chant. I don't know, but she was doing this chant all along and it did nothing. So why the hell now, all of a sudden, when you have just these two girlies against someone that's been around since AD. <laughs> like that's it. The baby vanishes and then Anna's able to walk again. Puts on her headpiece. One of these headpieces from the, the delicate outfits. Walking down the hallway to the nursery and she sees a normal baby in the crib. She picks up the baby. And also has her Oscar in the other hand. So she ended up getting everything that she wanted in the end. <laughs> and that's all it took. Yeah, that's the end. Um, it's good. Up until the last episode, American Horror Story has just been fumbling the bag the last couple of seasons with abruptly ending the seasons. And you know what? I will give credit where credit is due. Kim Kardashian. I mean, she was playing herself, but I have seen her act in other things. This is why I put off watching this season because I was like, I can't handle it. She's not horrible. <laughs> That's the best I can say about it. I think 3.5, you know what? 3.5 might be a little bit too generous. I think it's worth a watch. Okay, well, I'm done. I can't believe it. Now I'm just realizing we're done. Oh my God, people, we did it. Ah! I think I'll keep this, add these seasons to it. I'll just put it in my closet somewhere. I can't, I can't believe it. We did it, Joe. Thank you, sweaties. I realize most of my following now is from these videos. So thank you so much if you set through almost 12 hours worth of <laughs> <laughs> me talking. Thank you if you've become a part of our family here. I know I have some tried and trues from years and years ago. Da, dun, da, da, da. You are the MVP through the trenches. I'm going to make other long form videos too on um, different topics. I don't want my whole channel to just be American Horror Story, even though I love it so much and do other topics. So stay tuned for that. There is no rhyme or reason to my channel. I do all these videos on my own. It's really, it's all up to me. It's whatever I'm into at the moment. As soon as I upload this, I'll go ahead and get started on something new. <sighs> Did you hear that? That was my stomach. <laughs> that sounded like a cat. Thanks for coming along on this ride. I really appreciate it. You guys have made this very entertaining. Keep on coming back, sweaties, because we got more coming. This wig is so itchy. All right, I'm signing off. <sighs> all right, bye.